Preface and Epigraph Two Stories of North Pole Adventure This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell Preface and Epigraph this volume does not pretend to be a history of Arctic exploration. My aim has been to narrate some of the most thrilling incidents of polar adventure in such a graphic manner that the reader may feel something of the fascination which induces explorers, in spite of reverses and disasters, to attempt again and again to penetrate the vast region of snow and silence and solitude around the North Pole. Great care has been taken to ensure accuracy, and, wherever possible, the actual journals of the various expeditions have been consulted, besides a host of minor publications. Signed, Frank Mundell. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold. And ice mast high came floating by, as green as emerald. And through the drifts, the snowy cliffs, did send a dismal sheen. Nor shapes of men, or beasts, we can, the ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swound. By Samuel Taylor Coleridge End of Preface and Epigraph Chapter 1 of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The North Pole The Little Bear, Ursa Minor, is the name given to one of the most famous groups of stars in the Northern Hemisphere. One star in that constellation is called the Pole Star because it is directly over that point of the Earth's surface known as the North Pole. This mysterious spot is surrounded by extensive fields and vast mountains of ice, which the most daring explorers have tried in vain to penetrate. The Arctic Circle includes all the land and water contained within a line drawn round the Earth at a distance of 23.5 degrees, or 1,600 miles from the North Pole. In this portion of the globe, known as the polar regions, eternal winter reigns. The ocean is either frozen over, or is full of floating masses of ice, and the land is almost entirely covered with ice and snow throughout the year. During several months, the sun never rises over this part of the globe, and the winter is one long night. No sound breaks the awful silence which reigns over this vast region, and scarcely a living creature is to be seen. After the long winter has set in, strange lights are seen in the heavens, Mock suns appear surrounded by circles of vapour, tinted with the brightest hues of the rainbow. Then, too, are seen the most brilliant meteors, shedding a marvellous radiance over crag and pinnacle of glistening ice. These singular streams of light form across the sky great arches, through which flash bright streaks of red, blue, green, purple, and yellow flame. They are known as the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights. The untaught Indian regards this strange natural phenomenon with awe, 
believing them to be the spirits of his fathers roaming through the land of souls. Within the Arctic Circle are found the white bear, the reindeer, the muskox, the wolf, and the fox, and it is the home of the seal, the walrus, and the whale. The Eskimos who inhabit this inhospitable region are for the most part a simple, kindly race, who know nothing of the arts of civilized life. Their dwellings are of the rudest description. Their clothing consists of garments made of the skins of animals, and they obtain a livelihood by hunting and fishing. The polar regions were first explored by navigators who wished to obtain a passage to India and China along the northern shores of America. It was for this purpose that the Cabots and other early explorers made their famous voyages hundreds of years ago. Out of these attempts, at length there grew a strong desire on the part of some of the most celebrated seamen to penetrate to the North Pole itself. The story of these various expeditions is one of the most romantic and thrilling in the world's history. In no other field of naval enterprise have more indomitable courage, unwearying perseverance, complete self-denial, and skilful management of resources been displayed than in that of Arctic discovery. The following are a number of Arctic discoverers from 1500 to 1892. Aldrich, 1876. Carlson, 1863 and 1871. Collinson, 1851. To 1852. Dees and Simpson, 1837 to 1839. Edge, 1616 to 1617. Fisher, 1858. Giles, 1707. Hagerman, 1870. Hayes, 1860 to 1861. Hamilton, 1853. Inglefield, 1853. Johansson, 1878. Kane, 1853 to 1855. Kellett, 1849. Cole Dewey, 1870. Lykeff, 1773. Lambert, 1670. Leperu, 1787. Melgin and Skiratov, 1757. McClintock, 1859. Ney, 1594. Oftzin, 1736 to 1737. Pet, 1580. Payer, 1870. Rosmulov, 1718 to 1719. Richards and Osborne, 1853. Lee Smith, 1881. Senekov, 1805. Scoresby, 1822. Sirovatskoy, 1886. Willoughby, 1553. Wrangell, 1821. Weyprecht, 1872 to 1874. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Attempts to Reach the North Pole In more modern times, we erect monuments in honour of the men who do great deeds. 
but many of the old explorers to whom neither tablet nor statue were erected will never be forgotten for they have written their names in large characters on the map of the world among these is henry hudson a bay one of the largest in the world a river one of the most important in america a strait a vast territory and several towns remind us of one of the most enterprising navigators who ever lived the london merchants in spite of repeated failures do not seem to have been discouraged in their hope of finding a northern route to the rich countries of the east to them it mattered not whether they reached the land of spices and of gold by a northeast or a northwest passage so they tried both then a still bolder idea presented itself to the minds of these keen businessmen who were determined not to allow the spaniards and the portuguese to reap all the golden harvests of india and china they decided to attempt to reach the other side of the globe by sailing over the north pole itself this was indeed an idea worthy of the sons of the famous sea rovers who founded the english nation but who was there among the daring seamen of that adventurous age able and willing to conduct such an enterprise the merchants found the man they wanted in henry hudson who was an experienced and intrepid seaman and well skilled in nautical science when we read the detailed accounts of the preparations made by the various expeditions of to-day their iron ships propelled by steam power their hundred and one appliances to serve every conceivable purpose and their wealth of stores and their carefully chosen crews of picked men we hardly know whether to smile at the simplicity or to admire the audacity of such a man as hudson who in a small bark manned by ten men and a boy attempted a feat of such magnitude in his tiny vessel with its scanty crew hudson sailed from gravesend on the first of may sixteen o seven and within a fortnight he reached greenland in foggy weather with frozen sails and shrouds then he turned in a northeasterly direction until he reached spitzbergen here they saw a large number of seals and white bears one of which was killed and many of the crew made themselves ill with eating the animal's flesh hudson vainly attempted to make his way through the masses of ice and as his stores were exhausted he returned to england in september his brief voyage however was not a failure from a commercial point of view he did not reach the pole and probably had no idea how great a distance or what insurmountable obstacles lay between him and that mysterious spot but he made the english acquainted with the whale fishery of the spitzbergen seas which since then has been a continuous source of wealth in his first voyage hudson reached a higher latitude than any of the explorers who had preceded him he was therefore eager to try again and in the following year he undertook a second expedition and endeavoured to find a northeast passage by nova zembla when he returned some of his crew told an extraordinary story of having seen a mermaid the upper part of whose body resembled that of a woman with white skin and long black hair while the lower part of the body was that of a fish no doubt the imagination of the sailors had transformed a greenland seal into this creature of fancy which however 
still exists in poetry and fairy tales. Hudson's third voyage was made in the service of the Dutch, when, failing to find a northwest passage, he sailed down the coast of North America and discovered an opening, up which he sailed. This, he thought, might be a strait through which he could pass to eastern lands. It was, however, the beautiful river which bears his name, and on which the city of New York now stands. This discovery led to the establishment of a Dutch settlement for the purpose of carrying on the fur trade with the Indians. A fourth time do we find Hudson crossing the Atlantic, this time in an English ship, and which bore the same name as one of those in the recent expedition of Captain Nares, namely the Discovery. He sailed from the Thames in April 1610, on what proved to be his last voyage, and June found him at the mouth of Frobisher Strait. Numerous icebergs and contrary winds drove him out of his course, and threw a hitherto unknown strait into an extensive inland sea. Both of these waters, as Hudson Strait and Hudson Bay, still bear the great explorer's name. Day after day the vessel sailed on but no opening presented itself by which they could escape from the ice-bound sea into which they had unwittingly entered, and at length winter overtook them, and they were frozen in. By this time the men had become dissatisfied, for their provisions were exhausted, and they were afraid of being lost in the frozen regions. At length the ice broke up, and the ship stood to the northwest. The scanty provisions which remained in the vessel were fairly divided by the commander, who, seeing nothing but starvation before them, was so much moved that he wept when he gave it unto them. It was at this time that a mutiny broke out among the crew, some of whom declared that they would rather be hanged at home than starved abroad. To make the food last as long as possible, some of the crew resolved on a deed unworthy of British seamen. Seizing Hudson, they forced him, his son, and all the men who were sick into a boat and cast them adrift. Be it said to his honour, that John King, the carpenter, unable to prevent this terrible outrage, sprang into the boat, resolved rather to die with the captain than to abandon him. The boat and its unfortunate crew were never heard of again, and Henry Hudson, one of the bravest and most daring of English seamen, found a grave in the waters of the sea he had discovered. Of all the sea shapes death has worn, may mariners never know, such fate as Henry Hudson found in the labyrinths of snow. The ship reached Ireland in safety, but the few survivors were in a terrible plight. Some of the mutineers had been killed and wounded in quarrels among themselves, and all had suffered terribly from starvation. William Baffin, described as the Ablest, the Prince of Arctic Navigators, and who had already taken part in several expeditions in northern seas, went out in the Discovery on her fifth voyage in search of a northwest passage in 1616. Icebergs over 200 feet high and which Baffin reckoned as over 1,600 feet from top to bottom, were met with off the coast of Greenland. Pushing northward, the cold was so intense that on Midsummer Day the shrouds, ropes, and sails were so frozen that the men could scarcely handle them. 
determined not to be turned aside by any difficulty baffin succeeded in discovering a great opening which he named smith sound after sir thomas smith the chief of the merchant adventurers who had fitted out the expedition it is interesting to note that this opening discovered nearly three hundred years ago by william baffin has been regarded by all explorers from that time to the present as the only one by which there is any hope of reaching the north pole while in this sound baffin noted the greatest variation of the compass that had yet been known in fact he says a course northeast by east is true north a thing incredible and matchless in all the world besides the lateness of the season obliged the explorers to turn back to avoid being frozen in for many months they therefore made their way southward through the wide passage known as baffin bay and thence by davis strait to the atlantic ocean reaching england in august of the same year the solitude of those icy regions was not again broken for two hundred years End of chapter two Chapter three of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The First Royal Arctic Expeditions. The discovery of Hudson Bay and its valuable fisheries became famous about the middle of the seventeenth century. The French, who at this time had settlements in North America, were anxious to obtain possession of the ports and harbours on the great inland sea but before any decided action was taken charles the second had granted a charter to prince rupert and other adventurers to undertake an expedition to hudson bay for the discovery of a new passage into the south sea and for the finding of some trade for furs minerals and other considerable commodities this charter granted in sixteen sixty nine declared that the king wishing to promote their endeavours for the good of his people was pleased to confer upon them the exclusive possession with all the trade thereof of all the land and territories in and around hudson bay no sooner had the adventurers obtained this charter and found that for a trifling cost they could obtain most valuable furs from the indians than they at once gave themselves up to building forts and factories and in their desire to amass wealth paid no further attention to the clause which at any rate implied that their work was largely one of exploration and discovery after this for a considerable period we hear a good deal about the hudson bay company of traders but nothing about the northwest passage which was still unknown in seventeen sixty nine just one hundred years after the company had received their charter attention was called to the fact that the geographical discoveries contemplated had never been made and afraid of losing the valuable privileges which they possessed the company undertook to make expeditions into unknown regions this however was done in such a careless and half-hearted way that the failure which followed was a foregone conclusion samuel hearn the leader chosen by the company had with him a number of indians from the hudson bay territory they accompanied the explorers in the capacity of guides and hunters these men came across an eskimo encampment which they attacked in the night and in the most barbarous and cruel manner put to death about twenty men women and children 
It is a matter for regret that the agents of the company stood quietly by, without in any way attempting to prevent the massacre. The inhuman conduct of Hearn and his companions brought no punishment on them, but it was the cause of great suffering to Franklin and his men when they afterwards visited that region. The route by the North Pole, which Robert Thorne, merchant of Bristol, had suggested many years before, once more received royal attention, and George the Third was pleased to give every encouragement to countenance such an undertaking, and every assistance that could contribute to its success. Two of the stoutest ships in the navy, the racehorse and the carcass, under the command of Captain Phipps, sailed from the Nore in 1773 on the first royal expedition to the Arctic Seas. There is no doubt that this was fitted out in a much superior manner to any of the previous expeditions. The pilots on board the two vessels had already served as captains of Greenland ships. There was an astronomer in the company, and all instruments and appliances were the best that could be obtained. The first land they saw consisted of the high, barren and black rocks of Spitsbergen, and, having reached the point where the old discoverers had turned back, they made a determined effort to work their way among the ice, with but little success. The weather was exceedingly fine, mild and unusually clear. There was not a breath of air, and everywhere, as far as they could see, they were surrounded with ice, which soon closed in upon them. The men amused themselves by playing on the ice, but the Greenland pilots, who had never been so far before, were alarmed at the approach of winter. Soon the ice, which had been almost level with the water's edge, was forced higher than the main yard of the vessels by the pieces squeezing together. On the advice of the pilots, the men were set to work to cut a passage and warp the vessel through the small openings, hoping in this way to reach the open sea. With great labour, pieces of ice twelve feet thick were sawn through, but the utmost efforts of the sailors did not move the ships more than three hundred yards. On board the carcass, there was a young midshipman, who was appointed to command one of the boats sent out to explore a passage into the open water. While so engaged, some of the officers fired at and wounded a walrus, an animal remarkable for the human-like appearance of its head and the human passions it displays under provocation. The wounded animal dived into the water, and brought a number of its companions, when they all joined in an attack on the boat which contained their assailants. The animals succeeded in wresting an oar from one of the men, and if they had not been reinforced from the vessels, there is no doubt that their boat would have been staved in or upset. One night, the young midshipman to whom we have already referred set out with one companion to pursue a large white bear which he had seen on the ice. A fog came on, and when the lads were missed, the officers became exceedingly alarmed for their safety. Several hours afterwards, when the fog cleared away, the two adventurers were seen, at a considerable distance from the ship, engaged in conflict, with the monarch of the northern seas. At once a signal was made for them to return to the vessel. One of the lads obeyed, but it was unheeded by the young midshipman, for at that moment his ammunition was expended, and his only means of defence was the butt-end of his gun. Seeing the lad's danger, the captain of the ship fired a gun, 
which frightened the beast and caused it to make off. The midshipman then returned, and was severely reprimanded by the captain, first for leaving the ship to hunt the bear without permission, and second for not returning immediately the signal was made. On being asked for the reason of such conduct, the lad replied, I wish to kill the bear, that I might carry the skin to my father. This youth, who so fearlessly held his ground in combat with a polar bear, afterwards rose to high rank in the Royal Navy and brilliant fame in history. And it may be that part of the success of his afterlife could be attributed to the training he had in the Arctic seas while yet a midshipman. History does not record many stories of the boyhood of Lord Nelson, but this is one worthy of England's greatest sailor. Unwilling to winter in such an inhospitable region, the work of moving the vessels was carried on most vigorously, and at the same time all preparations were made to leave the vessels if by any chance they ran aground. By keeping both ships and boats in motion, a little progress was made, so that, when a breeze sprang up and all sail was set, the vessel succeeded in breaking through and returned to England. The voyage of Captain Phipps added nothing to what was already known of the Arctic seas. On the contrary, it did more harm than good, for the impenetrable wall of ice which he reported as existing at the point where he turned back is now known to be open during a part of almost every year. Captain Cook, one of the most famous navigators of any age, was now chosen to find a passage from the Pacific Ocean north through Bering Strait and round the coast of North America into the Atlantic. This route, we must remember, is exactly the opposite to that which so many of the early explorers had taken in their search for the Northwest Passage. In short, Cook was about to attempt to enter the northern seas at the point at which they had sought to leave them, and to reach the Atlantic at their point of entrance. Twice before had this brave-hearted sailor successfully made his way round the world. He had revealed to his countrymen the existence of a new island continent, and was believed to be a man who could carry through any expedition on which he set out. Some years before, a reward of £20,000 had been offered by Parliament to any British ships, not being of the Royal Navy, which should succeed in finding a northwest passage by the Hudson Bay route. A change was now made in the terms of this offer, to the effect that the reward would be paid to either the king's ships or merchantmen which succeeded in discovering any northern passage between the two great oceans. In 1776, the resolution and discovery sailed from Plymouth Sound and spent a considerable time exploring the South Pacific Ocean. Therefore, it was not until near the end of 1779 that Cook entered Bering Strait. He had found the gateway to the northern seas, but in spite of all his efforts, he could not force an entrance. The passage was completely blocked with ice that resisted all his efforts to penetrate. Returning to the southern seas, he called at the Sandwich Islands, where he was killed by the natives. While Cook was absent on his third and last voyage, which occupied over three years, the Lion, a vessel of the Royal Navy, was sent to Davis Strait to protect the British whale fishery, and to obtain information which would be useful to the vessel which the government intended to send out in the following year to meet Captain Cook, 
who it was confidently believed would discover a passage eastward from the pacific the lion went out again in the following year but the explorers became so bewildered among the icebergs that they soon returned in 1789, Alexander Mackenzie made an overland journey to the shores of the Polar Sea. In this expedition, he discovered the great river of Canada, which bears his name. And here ends the story of Arctic exploration to the close of the 18th century. One remarkable thing which all must notice in connection with the early adventurers is the fearless manner in which they conducted their expeditions when the art of navigation was in its infancy the science but little understood the instruments few and imperfect in barks of twenty-five or thirty tons burden ill-constructed ill-found and apparently ill-suited to brave the mountains of ice between which they had to force their way and the dark and dismal storms which beset them End of chapter three chapter four of stories of north pole adventure by frank mundell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two Famous Voyagers From the outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789 until the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, during which Europe was little more than one wide battlefield, there was no breathing time to continue the explorations round the Pole. The activity of the British Navy during this period of unrest had created a large number of first-rate officers and well-trained seamen, who, when peace was declared, were eager to take part in any expedition to satisfy their desire to win fame and fortune. Much money and many lives had already been spent in the various attempts to reach the Pacific through the icy regions of the North, and, as we have already seen, more than one attempt had been made to reach the Pole itself. Splendid results had followed the various attempts, and had again and again shown that British sailors would not give in, but were ready to suffer, and, if need be, to die rather than confess themselves beaten. Failure to reach the goal had only served to whet the curiosity of the nation, and, after all, enough success had attended the brave explorers of the past to encourage those in the present to try again. From the reports made by the navigators who had carefully examined the Arctic regions, everyone believed that the passage was blocked by ice and not by land, and that therefore there was every reason to suppose that somewhere an opening existed through which ships might pass. Even the pole itself was thought to be surrounded by an open sea, if only the icy barrier which encircled it could be penetrated. In 1817, the British government decided to send out four vessels. Two of them were to attempt to reach the Pacific by proceeding in a northerly direction across the Pole while the other two were to find a western route through Baffin Bay. Never before had so many experienced officers of the Royal Navy taken part in such an expedition. The Dorothea and the Trent were commanded by Captain Buchan and Lieutenant John Franklin, who afterwards became the greatest of Arctic explorers. Both of these officers had seen much service, and Buchan had spent several years on the coast of Newfoundland, while Franklin 
had been through the recent wars and had fought under Nelson at Trafalgar. These, then, were the two men sent out by the Admiralty to sail across the Pole to the Pacific. In April of the following year, the vessel sailed out of the Thames, and soon reached a high degree of latitude. Many of the crew had never before been in the Arctic seas, and they looked with curious eyes on the huge and often grotesque masses of ice which floated past them. When they saw for the first time the sun at midnight, the grandeur of the scene caused them to stand in groups on the deck long after they should have retired to rest. Severe weather came on, accompanied by heavy snowstorms, and the accumulation of ice on the rigging was so great that it had to be cut away with axes. At length they reached the spot where Phipps had been hemmed in. Here they found one vast unbroken plain of ice, connected so closely with the shore as to leave no passage for a vessel. They saw immense flocks of birds, which passed over their heads in a living cloud of more than three miles in length, completely darkening the air. From daylight till dark could be heard the cries of orcs, divers, cormorants, gulls, and other seabirds, while numberless seals and walruses were seen sporting in the water or basking on the shore. All sounds of life ceased when the sun set, and the silence of the night was only broken by the thundering boom of a bursting iceberg or the mighty crash of a falling rock. The walruses were so fearless that they swam round about the boats, and, regarding them as intruders, endeavoured to destroy them with their tusks. Several of these huge animals were killed, and found to be fourteen feet in length. One, which received several shots before it was killed, had nothing in its stomach but the garter of a Greenland sailor. While moored to the ice floe, unable either to reach the land or the open sea, the crews spent much of their time watching the strange animals who sported around them, and were greatly interested in the cunning displayed by the bears in their attempts to capture a seal or a walrus. At length an opening appeared in the ice, and the crews had to leave their walrus hunting, reindeer stalking, and shooting wildfowl to attend to the working of the ships. Their progress, however, was very slow, and a large number of the men were employed walking along the ice, hauling the vessels as best they could. The danger which they feared most for the ships was that they might be nipped in the ice. This nipping is caused by the constant changes which the ice undergoes, by the influence of wind and weather, when the edges of the pack meet with a terrific crash which nothing made of wood can withstand. In that case, a ship is either cut in two, or buried altogether, unless it is sufficiently light to be forced up and allow the edges of the ice to meet beneath it. Unable to find a northern route along the shores of Spitsbergen, Buchan and Franklin endeavoured to reach Greenland, when they suddenly found themselves threatened by an enormous pack of ice. Shock after shock took place, which made the timbers shiver. Finding it impossible to proceed, they had to resort to the desperate expedient of charging the pack. Iron plates and walrus hides were hung round the bows of the vessels to lessen the effect of the contact. The masts were also securely tied, and the hatches were battened down. 
nearer and nearer came the glittering masses which were being tossed hither and thither like corks on the bosom of the tempestuous ocean suddenly the vessels dashed amongst the churning breakers which were beating with thundering noise on the pack above the sound of the wind and waves was heard the cry steady hold on for your lives and every man laid hold of the part of the vessel nearest to him as it cut its way through the lighter ice and then met the pack with a shock that threw every man on the deck it is impossible to describe the successive dangers through which the vessels passed as they were helplessly tossed from pack to flow at the mercy of wind and wave and iceberg at length the open sea was reached but both ships were in such a battered condition that no time was lost in making for fairhaven in spitzbergen where they came to anchor it was then found that the dorothea was practically a wreck while the vessels were being repaired and refitted for the homeward voyage the northwest coast of spitzbergen was surveyed and enormous glaciers of great height and length were seen on more than one occasion the edge nearest the sea broke off with a noise resembling thunder and floated away to add one more to the countless icebergs of those dangerous seas in october the dorothea and the trent arrived safely in the thames thus says one of the officers terminated the third endeavour made under the auspices of the british government to reach the pole an attempt in which was accomplished everything that human skill zeal and perseverance under the circumstances could have effected and in which dangers difficulties and hardships were endured such as have rarely been met with in any preceding voyage while buchan and franklin were endeavouring to find a passage to the pole by sailing north the alexander and the isabella under captain ross and lieutenant parry were engaged in a similar expedition in search of a northwest passage to india ross and parry had both been employed in the navy from their earliest years and parry was familiar with the dangers and difficulties of navigation in arctic seas reaching the coast of greenland in may the explorers saw their first iceberg which was of an enormous size and which was regarded with great curiosity by most of the crew though as the commander remarks they ere long became only too familiar with these large masses off one of the islands the vessels anchored and an eskimo who had been on a visit to england and was now acting as interpreter proceeded on shore and shortly afterwards returned with a number of natives in their canoes captain ross and his officers soon became very friendly with the natives who gave him a sledge and dogs in return for a musket some of the women came on board and after partaking of coffee and biscuits in the cabin enjoyed a dance with the sailors on deck the master of ceremonies was the travelled eskimo who was at once seaman interpreter draughtsman fisher of seals and hunter of white bears a few days afterwards the vessels were found to be in the track of baffin which had not been followed for two hundred years but the fogs which surrounded them greatly hindered their progress and the vessels had to be assisted by the whole ship's company dragging at a rope and marching to music the performer leading the way 
At length they came to a large bay, which Ross named after Lord Melville, the first Lord of the Admiralty. It abounds with whales, many of which were captured by the explorers. This bay has been the scene of many terrible catastrophes. Whole whaling fleets have been nipped in the ice and crushed like walnuts. In one instance, nineteen vessels were destroyed, occasioning a loss of over £150,000. When this disaster befell the ships, more than a thousand men were encamped on the ice, on which they had erected tents, and were engaged in dancing and frolic. The day received the name of Baffin's Fair. Few lives have been lost in Melville Bay, for, when the vessels are destroyed, it is not difficult to reach the Danish settlements. Day after day was spent in slowly cutting a passage through the ice with great saws worked over a block suspended between poles. On one occasion, the pressure of the ice resulted in a trial of strength, which, for some time, seemed to be in favour of the ice. But when it appeared impossible for the ship longer to withstand the advancing ice, she rose several feet and avoided the contact. This was followed by a terrible collision between the two vessels, which it was impossible to prevent, as they were borne together by the ice. Anchors and cables were broken, and one boat was smashed to pieces. Just when all hope was gone, the two fields of ice began to recede or there is little doubt that both ships would have been destroyed. Not long afterwards, the vessels were clear. The Eskimos now appeared in large numbers, and drove backwards and forwards on the ice in their dog-sledges, but the explorers had some difficulty in opening up communications with them, as they seemed afraid that their visitors meant mischief. Friendly signs and presents thrown to them at last succeeded in quieting their fears, and when they found that the interpreter could speak their language, they were very curious to know what kind of creatures the ships were, and whether they came from the sun or the moon. Nor could they be persuaded that the vessels were not alive, as they had seen them move. After a time, Ross and Parry ventured to land, and approached the natives in a friendly manner for fear of frightening them. On reaching the group, they displayed a number of presents. The article which created the most astonishment was a looking-glass, in which, for the first time, they saw their own faces reflected. They were then persuaded to go on board and, to the amusement of the crews, they persisted in regarding the ships as living creatures, and saying, Who are you? What are you? Where do you come from? Is it from the sun or the moon? The interpreter then showed them every part of the vessel, and assured them that it was nothing but a floating house. It was clear, from the manner in which they tried to lift the various objects they saw, that they had no idea of the weight of iron. Leaving this place, they saw large numbers of whales which approached the ships without showing any signs of alarm. A native dance was here given by two Eskimo girls, which much resembled certain dances practised in India. Two days later, such dense flocks of birds appeared that from fifteen to twenty fell at every shot, and proved a welcome addition to their food supply. Having reached Smith Sound, Captain Ross came to the conclusion that no passage northward could be found. 
here he also observed the dip of the needle which was an evidence that they had approached very near the magnetic pole being as he supposed surrounded by mountains which in the following year were proved to be only a species of cloud he sailed westward and southward and again saw what he believed to be ridges of high mountains but which were nothing but deceptive appearances and to which he gave various names on the fourteenth of november the vessels reached grimsby in safety and though very little was added to the geographical knowledge which previous explorers had obtained he called attention to the productive fishing ground of melville bay which from that day to this has been frequented every summer by british whalers End of chapter four Chapter Five of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The First Winter in the Arctic Regions. Lieutenant Parry, who in the previous voyage was only second in command under Captain Ross, had no sooner returned to England then he expressed his dissatisfaction at the results achieved. In fact, he said that he could not understand why they had returned when they did, and he also declared that he was perfectly certain that a northwest passage existed, and would not be very hard to find. After an interview with Lord Melville, the First Lord of the Admiralty, Parry was placed in command of two vessels, the Heckler and the Gripper, with instructions to endeavour to discover a northwest passage from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. On the 4th of May, 1819, the Heckler set sail and was followed next day by the Gripper, and in little more than a month, the two vessels were among the icebergs of the northern seas. Wishing as far as possible to avoid the great enemy of the Arctic explorer, Parry gave the icebergs a wide berth, and made considerable progress along the west coast of Greenland. Here, however, the enemy could no longer be avoided. Icebergs became so numerous that from the mast Parry counted nearly a hundred of the larger size, while smaller ones seemed to be everywhere. In the middle of Baffin Bay, the vessels were scarcely able to proceed on account of the floes or ice fields, and, even assisted by the men hauling at ropes, they only made four miles in eleven hours. To the great delight of Parry, however, open water was again reached, and in one day over eighty whales were seen. Making all sail, the vessels at length reached Lancaster Sound, which Parry regarded as the gate to the unknown region of which he was in search. The mountains which Ross had so graphically described on the previous voyage were now found to be only creations of his imagination, for the vessels sailed over the spot where they had been said to stand. Such rapid progress was now made that the officers and men were filled with excitement, and the masts were crowded all day by an eager crowd of watchers. So little ice was seen that the explorers really thought that they had at last entered the polar sea, which was said to encircle the North Pole. At midnight the sun shone with the brightness of noonday, and the colour of the surrounding waters was the deep blue of the ocean. They had now reached the western part of Lancaster Sound, and two islands which they discovered were named Leopold Islands, 
after Prince Leopold. Then the ice once more appeared in such masses that their hopes of an open passage were shaken. Small white whales, about twenty feet in length, and narwhals, called by the sailors, sea unicorns, were very numerous, and afforded some amusement to the men, who hunted them in boats. Unable to proceed farther westward, the vessels were turned in a southerly direction, and succeeded in entering an inlet which, at its narrowest part, was only five miles wide, and which was named Prince Regent Inlet. Not wishing to be carried too far to the south, Parry returned to Lancaster Sound, where he found so much open water that his hopes revived. And as the crews were in good health and spirits, and the ships well provisioned, he determined to prosecute his search, although the early winter of the northern regions was fast approaching. For some days, rapid progress was made. New capes, islands, and inlets were passed in succession, to all of which names were given, and it was noticed that the farther north the vessels proceeded, the compasses became more and more untrustworthy, until they were no longer of any use for purposes of navigation. At length, they saw the coast of a large island, which was named Melville Island, in honour of Lord Melville. Now there appeared in the sky the first star they had seen, which warned them that winter was rapidly approaching, and that they could not hope to sail much longer in open water. An excursion on land was made, but no traces could be found of any inhabitants. Large numbers of deer, however, were seen. On the 4th of September, 1819, the explorers crossed, to their great satisfaction, the meridian of 110 degrees west of Greenwich, which entitled them to the reward of £5,000 offered by the government to such of His Majesty's subjects as might succeed in reaching that distant point. Their success was celebrated by such festivities as they could command under the circumstances, and a headland which they passed on that day was named Bounty Cape. Before settling down for the winter, Parry decided to proceed still farther west, and as the nights were now very dark, the vessels were made fast to an ice floe till daybreak. The rate of progress was now very slow, and for days together the ships were moored between the shore and the icebergs. One day, seven men went ashore to hunt the deer. When they did not return at night, the officers became alarmed for their safety, and men were sent out to look for them. The search party lost themselves in a snowstorm, and only found their way back in a most exhausted condition late at night by seeing the signal rockets of the ships. On the following day, a flagstaff was erected on the highest part of land, and a large ensign hoisted to serve as a guide to the lost men. Search parties were also sent out in all directions, and pikes bearing small flags were stuck into the ground at certain distances, while to each pike a bottle was fastened, containing instructions what to do. On the third day, four of the men, guided by the flagstaff, succeeded in reaching the ships, and shortly afterwards the other three were discovered and brought in. They had all suffered much from cold and fatigue, and some of them were severely frostbitten. Then, says Parry, In humble gratitude to God for this signal act of mercy, we distinguished the headland to the westward of the ships by the name of 
Cape Providence. Unable to find a safe anchorage, Parry decided to run back to Melville Island, and on the 24th of September they sailed into a bay which they had previously visited. Here they cut a canal through the ice by means of ice saws, and two days later the ships were anchored a cable's length from the beach, where they intended to remain during the winter. The preparations made by Parry were so thorough for the maintenance of good order and cleanliness, for the preservation of the health of the crews, and for the careful use of the stores, that he proved himself to be one of the most capable officers ever entrusted with so difficult an expedition. In the matter of food and clothing and exercise, rules were made and rigidly enforced, for Parry knew only too well that it was easier to prevent the men from falling sick than to restore them to health. He was also careful to retain the confidence of all, by his instructions, that not in a single instance should the officer's food be larger in quantity or better in quality than that given to the men. Knowing also how much cheerfulness promotes health, he entered heartily into a variety of plans for their amusement, and in the plays which were performed, he was one of the actors. A weekly newspaper, called the North Georgia Gazette and Winter Chronicle, was established. To prevent any of the men from being lost when out hunting, finger posts were erected on all the hills round about the harbour. On the 4th of November, the sun set, and was not again seen for 96 days, and it was during this period of darkness that Parry found the greatest difficulty in keeping his men sufficiently employed in work, exercise, and amusements. Christmas Day, the first spent by a body of Englishmen in the Arctic regions, was celebrated in a thoroughly old-fashioned manner. An extra allowance of rations was given out, and while everyone tried to add to the general enjoyment, they did not forget the friends at home. The cold during the winter was intense, and frostbites were very common among the men. Yet beyond a slight cold, none of them suffered from any lung complaint. The air was so clear that talking or singing in an ordinary tone of voice could be heard more than a mile away. At length, the sun again appeared to the great joy of the men, and during the month of March, the sky scenery was of the most magnificent description. In June, Parry made an exploration into the interior of the island, and was away for several days. In July, the melting of the ice was so rapid that before the end of the month, the two vessels were once more riding at anchor. On the 1st of August, the ice broke up, and the Heckler and the Gripper sailed out of their winter harbour, where they had been detained for ten months. To his great regret, Parry was obliged to give up the idea of proceeding farther westward, and made the best of his way home, reaching England on the 29th of October, 1820, after an absence of nearly 18 months. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Knight Errant of the Northern Seas While Parry was making the splendid discoveries recorded in the previous chapter, his friend, Lieutenant John Franklin, was engaged in an enterprise which has come to be regarded 
as one of the most extraordinary ever undertaken by man. The main objects of this expedition were to determine the latitudes and longitudes of all bays, rivers, harbours, etc., on the north coast of America, from the mouth of the Coppermine River eastwards, to place conspicuous marks at places where ships might enter, and to deposit information as to the nature of the coast which might be useful to Lieutenant Parry should he succeed in finding a northwest passage along the American shore. Accompanied by Dr. John Richardson, George Back, Robert Hood, and a seaman named Hepburn, Franklin embarked at Gravesend on the 23rd of May, 1819, and reached York Factory, Hudson Bay, at the end of August. On the 9th of the following month, the explorers set out and travelled a distance of 857 miles to Fort Chippewan on Lake Athabasca, which was reached on the 8th of February, 1820. In the summer, the explorers embarked on Lake Athabasca in three canoes, accompanied by sixteen Canadian voyagers. Passing out at the northwest end of the lake, the canoes entered Slave River, which connects Lake Athabasca with the Great Slave Lake. Their progress was rapid, and in eleven days they reached Fort Providence on the other side of the Great Slave Lake. Then they advanced to Winter Lake, where they arrived on the 19th of August. Here they decided to pass the winter, and erected a house, to which they gave the name of Fort Enterprise. Early in the month of June, 1821, the party quitted the fort, most sincerely rejoicing that the long-wished-for day had arrived, when they were to proceed towards the final objects of the expedition. By the end of the month, the Coppermine River was reached, and in eighteen days, Franklin and his men launched their frail boats on the waters of the Polar Sea. Sailing eastward, they discovered and named several islands. Then the canoes were steered to the north, and again to the east, in the vain hope of finding a way to the eastern side of the continent. Storms arose, and the canoes were so badly damaged as to make it impossible to proceed farther. Only a few days' provisions remained, and, sorely against his will, Franklin was obliged to turn his back on the sea which it had cost him so much to reach. Yet he had succeeded in tracing the unknown shores of the Polar Sea a distance of 840 miles, and navigated waters which had never before been sailed on except by Eskimos. He only abandoned the enterprise when he saw that a farther advance would endanger the lives of the whole party, and prevent the knowledge of what had been done from reaching England. The return journey was therefore commenced, and after a perilous voyage, the canoes reached Hood River. Here, says Franklin, terminated our voyage on the Arctic Sea, during which we had gone over 650 geographical miles. On the 1st of September, the Great March Inland began. What follows is a record of unparalleled hardships, endured with heroic patience. With each man carrying about ninety pounds of baggage, and weakened by long exposure to the rigours of the climate and insufficient food, the progress was necessarily slow, and they advanced at the rate of about a mile an hour. On the 4th of September, the last piece of pemmican and a small quantity of arrowroot were served out. Rain, snow, and wind added to the misery of the situation. For days they lived on a kind of lichen, 
called by the canadians rock tripe bones made brittle by burning pieces of skin and even the remains of their old shoes and whatever scraps of leather they had were utilized to lessen the pangs of hunger which distressed them even more than the cold starvation looked them in the face and back volunteered to go forward and prepare for their arrival at fort enterprise his offer was accepted and accompanied by a few men he set out several days passed and then the men were so thoroughly exhausted that franklin determined to push forward and send assistance leaving dr richardson hood and hepburn in charge of the remainder of the party he set out accompanied by four men cheered with the thought of the comfort that awaited them at fort enterprise the weary and starving little band struggled on walking in garments frozen and stiff and eating their spare pairs of shoes at length they reached the fort but what a different sight met their gaze from that which they expected there was no fire on the hearth no provisions nothing but four bare walls a note left by back told them that he had gone on to the indian encampment soup made of pounded bones and singed hide together with rock tripe was their only food for eighteen days when richardson and hepburn arrived they had a melancholy tale to tell hood had been murdered by an indian whom the doctor afterwards shot in self-defence they brought with them a partridge which hepburn had shot and the sixth part of this was the first morsel of flesh that franklin and his companions had tasted for thirty-one days relief came at last back had lost no time in sending food to the fort and to do so he had undergone hardships which nothing but the hope of obtaining help for his friends could have enabled him to endure the difficulties which afterwards beset franklin and his companions were slight in comparison with those through which they had already passed and on the fourteenth of july eighteen twenty two they reached york factory whence they embarked for england thus says franklin ended our long fatiguing and disastrous travels in north america having journeyed by water and by land including our navigation of the polar sea five thousand five hundred and fifty miles undaunted by the disasters and the sufferings which he had experienced franklin determined to make a further exploration of the north american coast he therefore laid before the lords of the admiralty a plan for an expedition overland to the mouth of the mackenzie river and then by sea to the northwestern extremity of america with the combined object also of surveying the coast between the mackenzie and the copper mine rivers his proposals were favourably received and preparations were made to fit out an expedition three boats were specially built at woolwich for the navigation of the polar sea and arrangements were made for a supply of provisions along the proposed route franklin now a captain set sail from liverpool on the sixteenth of february eighteen twenty five accompanied by dr richardson and lieutenant back for some time before the day of sailing franklin's wife had been in weak health and to relieve the monotony of the sick-room she made a small silken union jack her husband wanted to delay his departure but this his wife would not hear of go she said giving him the flag never unfurl it until you plant it on the shores of the polar sea 
A few days after the expedition sailed, she crossed the boundary line of that undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns. On their arriving at New York on the 15th of March, Franklin and his companions lost no time in making their way to the Canadian lakes, and in about six months reached the mouth of the Mackenzie River. The men pitched their tent on the beach, and Franklin caused the Union Jack to be hoisted, which his wife had presented to him as a parting gift. His feelings overpowered him, but only for a moment, and, suppressing his emotion as best he could, he received with becoming cheerfulness the congratulations of his companions on having thus planted the British flag on this remote shore of the Polar Sea. After sailing about for some time, they returned to the winter quarters which had been erected at Great Bear Lake during their absence, and named Fort Franklin. Here they spent Christmas Day. The best food they had at command was placed before the men, and on the following evening a dance was given. The party numbered about sixty persons, and included Englishmen, Highlanders, Canadians, and Indians. As Franklin remarks, Seldom, perhaps, in such a confined space as our hall, was there greater variety of character, or greater confusion of tongues. But perfect harmony prevailed, and no unpleasant incident occurred to mar the joy of the occasion. In the early summer of 1826, the explorers returned to the mouth of the Mackenzie River, where they separated into two parties, the one under Franklin, exploring to the west, and the other under Richardson, to the east. A few days later, Franklin's party encountered a number of Eskimos. Trade was opened with the natives, and for a time, all went well, but their cupidity at length overcame their friendship, and they beset the boats with the evident intention of plundering them. For some time the men tried to keep them at bay, but as Franklin had forbidden the shedding of blood, their resistance was not altogether effective, and it was not till a volley had been fired over their heads that they retreated. Many articles had, however, been stolen, and several of the sailors had narrowly escaped severe wounds. Franklin afterwards made a speech to the Eskimos through an interpreter, in which he warned them that the first man who came within range would be shot. This caution had the desired effect, and the explorers were left in peace. After this, Franklin resumed his voyage westward along the shores of the Polar Sea, but his progress was greatly obstructed by drifting ice and fogs. He persevered, however, in face of these difficulties, and before the approach of winter compelled him to return, he had explored about 400 miles of a previously unknown coast. Meanwhile, Dr. Richardson had been carrying on his explorations to the eastward, and giving names to the more striking bays and headlands of the coast. On reaching the Coppermine River, he disembarked, and made his way by land and river to Fort Franklin. On the way, he came across the remains of some of the fires that had been made in the former terrible march. The journey was accomplished without mishap, and on the 1st of September, the fort was reached. A few weeks later, Franklin also arrived safe and well. Thus ended the second land expedition, and the narrative is a pleasing relief to the succession of disasters which attended the former enterprise. 
we do not again meet with Sir John Franklin in the Arctic regions till the year 1845. About that time, the most eminent scientific men and explorers of the day urged the government to fit out an expedition to make one more attempt at the discovery of the Northwest Passage. Six years which Sir John Franklin had spent as Governor of Tasmania had increased rather than diminished his enthusiasm for Arctic discovery, and when, on his arrival in England, he heard of the proposed enterprise, he laid claim to the post of commander as his by right. The government, only too glad to avail themselves of the services of so experienced an explorer, were prepared to accept him at once. The First Lord of the Admiralty kindly suggested, however, that Franklin should rest on his laurels. "'I might find a good excuse for not letting you go, Sir John,' said he, "'in the rumour that informs me that you are sixty years of age.' "'No, no, my lord,' exclaimed Franklin, "'I am only fifty-nine.' This characteristic reply swept away the last and only objection to Franklin's appointment. Two ships of the Royal Navy, the Erebus and Terror, were thoroughly overhauled and fitted out for the voyage. A warming and ventilating apparatus of the most improved construction was fitted up in each ship, and, for the first time in the annals of Arctic exploration, both were fitted with an auxiliary screw and engine. The outfit included warm bedding, clothing, medicines, and an ample store of provisions for three years. On the 19th of May, 1845, the two ships, each with 69 officers and men on board, set sail from the Thames on what proved to be their last voyage. On the 12th of July, they reached Greenland and, a fortnight later, they were seen by a whaler moored to an iceberg and waiting for an opportunity to cross over to Lancaster Sound. A message was sent on board the whaler inviting the captain to dinner with Sir John Franklin next day, but the meeting never took place. A favourable breeze sprang up, and the vessels parted. This was the last ever seen of these good ships, and of that company of gallant hearts, among the most truly noble that ever left the shores of England. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Champion of the North It will be remembered that Parry returned from his first expedition in 1820. The success which had attended this voyage at once placed its captain in the foremost rank of Arctic discoverers. As a result of his voyage, the existence of a northwest passage was now regarded as certain, and there was no doubt that persistent attempts would ultimately lead to its discovery. Another expedition was accordingly fitted out, and the command was given to Parry. The vessels engaged were the Fury and the Heckler. On the 8th of May, 1821, they left the Nore, and in about two months reached Hudson Strait. Thence they sailed to Repulse Bay. Parry thoroughly explored this inlet, in the hope of finding an opening to the westward, but it was found to be completely landlocked. This discovery was the first notable achievement of Parry's second Arctic expedition. August, September, and the first few days of October 
was spent in a minute examination of the coast of the American continent. Signs of the speedily approaching winter warned the captain that it was time to be making everything snug, and he then began to look about for a harbour. After great toil, the vessels reached a suitable bay on the south side of Winter Island, but before the ships could be got into position, a channel about half a mile long had to be sawn through the ice. The arrangements which Parry made for the health and comfort of the sailors were much the same as on the previous occasion. Schools were established in each ship, and the hardy tars set themselves with great zeal to master the three R's. At Christmas, sixteen well-written copies were produced by those who, two months before, could scarcely form a letter. The scientific side of the expedition was not forgotten, and an observatory and house were built for magnetic and astronomical observations. On Christmas Day, divine service was held on board the Fury, and attended by both officers and men of the expedition. Among the luxuries which the dinner on that day afforded was a joint of English roast beef, which had been preserved by rubbing the outside with salt. On the 1st of February, 1822, a number of strange people were seen coming over the ice towards the ships. When they were viewed through glasses, the cry was raised, Eskimos! Eskimos! Parry and several of the officers went forward to meet them. As they approached, the Eskimos stood still and saluted the strangers by beating their breasts. An active traffic was soon set on foot, the sailors receiving furs and whalebone in exchange for nails, knives, and other similar commodities. The strangers were now invited to visit the Eskimo dwellings, and they eagerly availed themselves of the opportunity. The village consisted of five huts, constructed simply of snow and ice. After creeping through two low passages, they gained the interior, and saw a sight at once interesting and novel. The inner apartments were circular, with arched domes about seven feet high in the centre. The women were seated on the beds at the sides of the hut, each having her little fireplace or lamp, with all her children, domestic utensils, and dogs about her. A block of clear ice in the roof served as a window. It was not until the beginning of July that the ice opened sufficiently to allow the ships to be taken out of their winter quarters. At starting, many dangers were encountered. The heckler was almost crushed to pieces in the ice, and within a short distance of the fury, two icebergs collided with such force that numberless huge masses were thrown fifty or sixty feet into the air. Fortunately, the ship was kept clear, or she would have foundered. Proceeding northward, the explorers saw before them a bold and high range of coast. A reference to a rough chart, which had been drawn by one of the Eskimos, informed them that they were approaching a strait of which the natives had often spoken as leading westward into the open sea and which Parry regarded as the gate of the Northwest Passage. Their farther progress was again stopped, however, by an unbroken sheet of ice extending as far as the eye could reach. A party, therefore, left the ships and made their way on foot across the ice and over the islands that lined the southern shore of the strait. In four days they reached a peninsula overlooking the narrowest part of the strait, at this point not more than two miles wide. 
Beyond us to the west, says Parry, the shores again separated to a distance of several leagues, and in that direction no land could be seen to the utmost limits of a clear horizon. Over this we could not entertain a doubt of having discovered the Polar Sea. Parry and his men celebrated the discovery by three hearty cheers, and named it Fury and Heckler Strait. An unsuccessful attempt was afterwards made to navigate the channel, when it was found that a solid ice field shut out all possibility of a passage. The winter was passed in a manner similar to the previous one at Winter Island, and in the middle of August 1823 the ships were freed from the ice. Parry was so anxious to achieve the Northwest Passage that he proposed spending a third winter in the polar regions. But an outbreak of scurvy among the sailors caused him to give up the plan, and he began the voyage homeward, arriving in England in October. This expedition greatly increased the geographical knowledge of the regions explored, and though unsuccessful in its main object, it was regarded by those in authority as giving great promise of future success. Accordingly, within two months after Parry's return, he was appointed to the command of a new expedition for the further exploration of the polar seas. With the Heckler and the Fury under his command, he set sail from Northfleet on the 19th of May, 1824. He was ordered to sail to Lancaster Sound, and to proceed through Barrow Strait and Prince Regent Inlet, and endeavour to reach the sea, which Franklin had discovered at the mouth of the Coppermine River, and so westward to the Pacific. Unfortunately, the season was unusually severe, and it was not till the 10th of August that they entered Lancaster Sound, which was found to be free from ice, except that here and there a berg was seen floating about in that solitary grandeur of which these enormous masses, when occurring in the midst of an extensive sea, are calculated to convey so sublime an idea. Pushing on, Prince Regent Inlet was reached about six weeks later, and Parry prepared to spend his fourth winter in the Arctic regions. On the 20th of July, 1825, the Heckler and the Fury were enabled, through the breaking up of the ice, to get clear out to sea. But, steer in whatever direction he might, Parry constantly found his progress barred by immense masses of ice. At length there seemed a chance of a passage to the south, but again the ice closed in upon him. Anxious not to lose a foot of open water, he pushed on as far as possible and then moored his vessels to the grounded masses upon the beach. Suddenly, to his great alarm, he observed that the sea ice was in motion, and that there was the greatest danger of the ships being crushed between the advancing ice field and the shore. Unfortunately, his fears were well grounded, for though the heckler escaped without serious injury, the Fury was repeatedly driven on the beach, and had many of her stout timbers stove in. The commander trusted that this would prove as harmless as the many shocks which the vessel had already received, but it was soon found that the water came in faster than four pumps could keep it out. An examination of the vessel was accordingly made when it was seen that she was no longer seaworthy. So, after a consultation with his officers, Parry decided to abandon her. The crew of the Fury were therefore received on board the Heckler, but the stores, owing to want of room, 
were left behind this disaster entirely altered the plans of the expedition so far little progress had been made and the difficulties of navigation coupled with the lateness of the season and the reduction of the stores determined the commander to return to england at once the voyage though stormy was accomplished without further mishap on the twelfth of october eighteen twenty five within six months after his arrival in england we find the indefatigable parry once more before the admiralty with a plan for reaching the north pole by means of travelling in sledge boats over the ice or through any spaces of open water that might occur the advantages that science might derive from such a journey even if it did not reach the goal caused the admiralty to look favourably on this daring scheme and captain parry was instructed to make preparations for carrying it out two boats twenty feet long by seven feet broad were constructed at woolwich under parry's direction they resembled what were called troop boats and had a capacious flat floor they were framed of ash and hickory covered with waterproof canvas over this were successive layers of fir and oak with a sheet of stout felt between runners on each side of the keel fitted them to be drawn over the ice like a sledge the heckler left the nore on the fourth of april eighteen twenty seven on her fourth arctic voyage steering northward spitzbergen was reached and then began a long and tedious search for a suitable harbour in which the heckler might lie safely at anchor during the absence of the boats it was not till the eighteenth of june that a secure haven was found on the northern spitzbergen coast and named heckler cove no time was now lost and two days later the boats named respectively the enterprise and the endeavour were ready to start the party numbered four officers and twenty-four men provisions for seventy-one days were taken and consisted of pemmican biscuits cocoa etc a quantity of spirit of wine was also carried to serve as fuel next day the boats quitted the ship amid three hearty cheers from those left behind for two days they sailed over a calm sea and then they reached a small floe onto which they hoisted their boats captain parry describes in an interesting manner the singular mode of travelling which they now adopted the first step was to turn night into day that is they began their journey in the evening and ended it in the morning thus while they had quite enough light they avoided the glare of the sun on the snow and the blindness it often produces besides the snow being harder at night presented a firmer surface to the runners of the sledge this travelling by night and sleeping by day says parry so completely inverted the natural order of things that it was difficult to persuade ourselves of the reality and there were several of the men who declared that they never knew night from day during the whole excursion their day was always commenced by prayers after which they took off their fur sleeping dresses and put on those for travelling breakfast consisted of warm cocoa and biscuit after a journey of five or six hours a halt was made for dinner after which the journey was resumed for another five or six hours according to circumstances they then stopped for the night as they called it though it was usually early in the morning the boats were hauled close alongside each other 
and the sails, supported by the masts and oars, were spread over as an awning. Every man then put on dry stockings and fur boots. Supper over, the officers and the men smoked their pipes, and, forgetting the toils of the day, enjoyed an interval of ease. After prayers, they lay down to sleep in the bottom of the boat, and in seven hours, the sound of a bugle, blown by the man on guard, roused them to their breakfast of cocoa, and to a repetition of the same arduous duties. The progress for several days was very slow and laborious. The flows were small, exceedingly rough, and cut up by lanes of water, which could not be crossed without unloading the boats. This obliged them to make three, and sometimes four, journeys with the boats and baggage. Thus, on one occasion, we find them, in making a mile to the northward, travelling to and fro about ten miles, in order to keep the party and the supplies together. Rain, accompanied by dense fogs, added to the difficulties of the route. Many a time Parry was so beset in the soft snow that, after trying in vain to extricate his legs, he was compelled to sit down and rest before making further attempts, while the men who were dragging the sledges were often obliged to crawl on all fours to make any progress at all. Such was the stupendously laborious manner in which the expedition crept northward from day to day. Still they pressed forward, full of hope that they would yet reach the solid fields of unbroken ice which former explorers had spoken of as stretching away to the north. These hopes were, however, doomed to disappointment. From a hummock forty feet in height, Parry had a view of the surrounding masses, but all presented the same broken and rugged appearance. He therefore relinquished all hope of reaching the pole, but resolved to push on and try to reach the 83rd parallel of latitude. On the 22nd of July, the expedition had reached latitude 82 degrees 43 minutes, and it seemed as if success was fairly within their reach, when Parry made a discovery which filled him with disappointment. Though their progress had been better for some days, he found that they did not get proportionably nearer the 83rd parallel. Then the unpleasant fact forced itself on his notice, that during their eight hours of sleep, they were being drifted to the southward by the current which prevailed in this part of the polar sea. He therefore made up his mind to return. A day was spent in making observations, and then, on the 27th, the return voyage was commenced. Sincerely as we regretted, writes Parry, not having been able to hoist the British flag in the highest latitude to which we had aspired, we shall perhaps be excused in having felt some little pride in being the bearers of it to a parallel considerably beyond that mentioned in any other well-authenticated record. No incident of any importance occurred on the return journey, and Heckler Cove was reached without mishap on the 21st of August, after an absence of 61 days, during which they had travelled 1,127 miles. A week later, the Heckler set sail on her homeward voyage, and reached England in safety. By a singular coincidence, Captain Franklin had returned from his second expedition to the Polar Sea on the same day as Parry, and the two great seamen, arriving at the Admiralty within ten minutes of each other, were both surprised and pleased at this most remarkable and unexpected meeting. 
Thus ended Parry's last voyage. For months after his return, he was received with enthusiasm wherever he went, and honours, including knighthood, were showered upon him both at home and on the continent. When he died in 1855, the Times spoke of him in language which is as true at the present time as on the day when it was written. No successor on the path of Arctic adventure has yet snatched the chaplet from the brow of this great navigator. Parry is still the champion of the North. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Discovery of the Magnetic Pole After the return of Parry's expedition in 1827, Captain John Ross submitted to the Admiralty the plan of a voyage for the discovery of the Northwest Passage by way of Prince Regent Inlet. Steam had recently been applied to ocean navigation, and the captain thought that a steamship might succeed where sailing vessels had failed. The government, however, did not look with approval on the new venture and it was not till 1829 that Ross was enabled, through the liberality of his friend Felix Booth, to fit out an expedition. He accordingly purchased the Victory, a paddle steamer which for some time had been employed between Liverpool and the Isle of Man. The vessel was strengthened, and many other improvements were made. Provisions were laid in for a thousand days, and then all was ready to start. Many naval officers volunteered their services, and even offered to bear a share of the expenses. But Ross had already chosen as his second-in-command his nephew, Lieutenant James Ross, who had sailed with Parry in all his expeditions. On the 23rd of May, 1829, the Victory sailed from Woolwich. At the outset, the steam engine was found to be a failure. At full speed, it did not propel the vessel faster than three miles an hour, and it had frequently to be stopped entirely for repairs. Early in August, Lancaster Sound was reached. Sailing thence, the explorers passed through Regent Inlet and anchored within a quarter of a mile from the spot where the Fury had been wrecked. It was with no common interest, writes Ross, that we proceeded to the only tent which remained entire. The canisters of preserved meat and vegetables had been piled up in two heaps and though quite exposed to all the changes of the climate for four years, they had not suffered in the slightest degree. On opening the canisters, he was surprised to find that all the provisions were in an equally good condition. From this store, Ross replenished his own stock, and then sailed away to make fresh discoveries. Pursuing a southwesterly course, a few bays and rivers were named, and then the explorers came upon a land stretching far to the south, to which the name of Boothia was given, in honour of Felix Booth, who had fitted out the expedition. Going on shore with all the officers, Ross hoisted the colours and took formal possession of the land in the name of the king. As the season was now rapidly drawing to a close, he decided to take up his winter quarters as soon as possible. With great difficulty, on account of the quickly accumulating ice, a large and sheltered bay was reached, which promised a safe harbour, 
and arrangements for making the victory a comfortable abode, were at once begun. An embankment of snow was thrown up around the vessel, and the deck was covered to the depth of two and a half feet. The dreary monotony of the winter was unrelieved by any noteworthy incident. A number of Eskimos visited the ship, and one old man, who had lost his leg in an encounter with a bear, was, to his great astonishment and delight, supplied with a wooden one by the ship's carpenter. The explorers invited several of the natives to dinner, and were greatly astonished at the relish with which they drank large quantities of oil, in preference to any of the other liquids which were offered to them. It was not till the 17th of September, 1830, that the ice drifted off the land, and the victory was once more afloat. She had only advanced three miles when she was stopped by ice. In a few days she was again frozen in, and destined to spend another winter in almost exactly the same spot as before. This circumstance had a depressing effect on the minds of the men, but their leader did not allow them much time for indulging in melancholy forebodings, and it was during this, the second season of their imprisonment, that the one great and important discovery of the expedition was made. For many years, the exact position of the magnetic pole had engaged the attention of navigators, but no satisfactory solution of the question had yet been achieved. To set the matter at rest was now the object of Ross's ambition. On the 27th of May, 1831, he set out, accompanied by his nephew and several men. Crossing the Isthmus of Boothia, and journeying along the shores of a wide inlet on the western side of the peninsula, they at length reached a point which was calculated to be within fourteen miles of the great object of their search. Leaving behind the larger part of their baggage and provisions, they hastened forward, and at eight o'clock on the morning of the 1st of June, they stood upon the source of that mysterious agency by which vessels trace their path through the ocean and towards which millions of compasses are ever pointing, the magnetic pole. There was nothing in the appearance of the surrounding country to indicate so famous a spot. The land was low near the coast, rising about a mile inland into ridges fifty or sixty feet high. Nature had erected no monument to denote the spot which she had chosen as the centre of one of her dark and great powers. The explorers hoisted the British flag, and took possession of the magnetic pole and its adjoining territory, in the name of Great Britain and King William the Fourth. The commander also raised a lofty cairn, under which he deposited a canister containing a record of his discovery. On the 13th of June, they returned to the ship. In August, another attempt was made to get the victory into open water, but she had only sailed four miles when she was again frozen up for the third winter. The health of the men now began to be affected, and it became evident that if, in the ensuing summer, the ship could not be moved, the men must. Their only means of escape was to proceed in the boats, draw them over the ice to Fury Beach, when, after supplying themselves with a fresh stock of provisions, they might reach Davis Strait and return to England in one of the whalers. Accordingly, on the 29th of May, 1832, the victory was abandoned, 
and her crew commenced one of the most laborious marches on record. In little over a month, they reached Fury Beach, where they obtained a plentiful supply of provisions. Launching their boats on the 1st of August, they steered to the north, but, meeting with a continuous stretch of ice, the unfortunate explorers were compelled to return to Fury Beach, where they spent their fourth Arctic winter in a canvas house. Scurvy, that scourge of the polar regions, broke out, and one man died. Their situation became daily worse, and Ross knew that if they were not able to get away from the inhospitable coast during the ensuing summer, the chances of their surviving another winter were indeed very slight. On the 15th of August, 1833, the ice broke up, and they again set out. For once, Fortune smiled on them, and, aided by a favourable breeze, they reached Regent Inlet. Here they encamped, but after a few hours' rest, they were once more afloat, and, during the next day, made seventy-two miles. Then the wind fell away, but the men were not now to be denied progress. They got out their oars and rowed for twenty hours, till they were utterly exhausted. A few days of stormy weather followed, during which they were confined to their tent, but this did not cause them much uneasiness, for they were now near the end of their wanderings. Early on the morning of the 26th of August, a sail was seen. Failing to attract the attention of those on board the vessel, Ross and his men launched their boat, and by dint of hard rowing, approached near enough for their signals to be seen. A boat was at once sent to their aid, and they were taken on board. Strange to say, the ship was the Isabella of Hull, the identical vessel which Ross had commanded in his first voyage to the Arctic Seas. She carried them safely to England, where they arrived on the 19th of October, 1833, after an absence of five years. During this expedition, 600 miles of coastline had been discovered, and the importance of the information obtained regarding the magnetic pole cannot be overestimated. Ross received the credit of having performed a great public service, and the honour of knighthood was conferred upon him. His nephew was promoted to the rank of post-captain, and all who had taken part in the expedition were suitably rewarded. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Search for Franklin Nearly two years had elapsed since the departure of the Franklin expedition in the Erebus and Terror, and as no tidings were received, the feeling became general throughout England that some disaster had befallen the gallant explorer and his men. A council of naval officers of Arctic experience was held, and it was decided to make preparations for a relief expedition should no news arrive during the summer. The season passed, but the ominous silence continued unbroken, and the suggestion of the council took definite shape. It would be impossible, within the limits of this book, to give even the briefest account of the numerous expeditions which were sent out to search for Franklin during the next few years. The government fitted out a whole fleet of ships, the Hudson Bay Company equipped several land parties, and Lady Franklin, 
the noble wife of the heroic explorer spent the greater part of her fortune in trying to obtain news of her husband's fate america also came to her aid and henry grinnell a merchant of new york sent two vessels to the arctic sea at his own expense the people of tasmania sent the sum of seventeen hundred pounds to clear away the mystery that enshrouded the fate of their former governor we must therefore confine our attention to the more important of these gallant enterprises the first news of the missing expedition was obtained in eighteen fifty by captain penny of the lady franklin who discovered the first winter quarters of the erebus and terror on the shores of beachy island he found a hut neatly built of stones on one side of it was a recess which had been evidently used as a fireplace as there were still a few handfuls of coal lying in it scattered about were a number of tins bearing the label of a variety of preserved meat which had been furnished in large quantities to franklin's expedition torn mittens cotton rags and a newspaper bearing the date of september eighteen forty four were also found further search revealed many other evidences of the former presence of their countrymen but there was no written record to tell in what direction they had gone along the northern shore of the island the graves of three of the crew of the erebus and terror were found with the following inscriptions sacred to the memory of john torrington who departed this life january the first a d eighteen forty six on board h m s terror aged twenty years sacred to the memory of john hartnell a b of h m s erebus died january the fourth eighteen forty six aged twenty five years thus saith the lord of hosts consider your ways haggai one seven sacred to the memory of william brain r m of h m s erebus died april the third eighteen forty six aged thirty two years choose ye this day whom ye will serve joshua twenty four fifteen i thought said one of the officers i traced in the epitaphs on the graves of the men from the erebus the manly and christian spirit of franklin in the true spirit of chivalry he their captain and leader led them amidst dangers and unknown difficulties with iron will stamped upon his brow but the words of meekness gentleness and truth were his device on the tenth of january eighteen fifty another ship named the investigator sailed from the thames to take part in the search she was commanded by captain mcclure an officer of great courage and experience his instructions were to proceed to the arctic sea by way of bering strait on the twenty first of august the investigator crossed the mouth of the great river mackenzie and in ten days reached cape bathurst the season was now drawing to a close and instead of the usual continued daylight three hours of every night were dark at intervals during this period guns and rockets were fired to serve as signals to any parties of the franklin expedition that might be in the neighbourhood while at cape bathurst mcclure carried on communication with the eskimos and tried to find out if they knew of the existence of land to the north but without success having obtained a promise from the natives 
that they would be kind to any white men who came that way, the captain resumed his voyage. Pushing on in a northeasterly direction, he entered Prince of Wales Strait, where, on the 30th of September, he found himself beset by ice and unable to extricate the ship. The early days of October were spent in making everything on board as comfortable as possible, and as the commander knew that in the Arctic regions despair meant death, he determined to give his men no opportunity for indulging in a weakness which the monotony of the surroundings made only too easy. He accordingly organised a number of expeditions to explore the lands on either side of the strait. On the 21st of the month, he himself set out on a sledge excursion to Barrow Strait, about 30 miles distant. The 26th of October, 1850, was a red-letter day for the explorers, and marked an epoch in the history of Arctic discovery. On the morning of that day, they ascended a hill 600 feet high before daybreak. As the sun rose, a wondrous panorama was revealed. Prince Albert Land stretched away to the eastward, and Banks Land was seen to terminate in a low point about 12 miles ahead. Away to the north, across the entrance to the Prince of Wales Strait, extended the frozen waters of that western reach of Barrow Strait, now known as Melville Sound. Raised as they were at an altitude of 600 feet above its level, the eyesight embraced a distance which precluded the possibility of any land lying in that direction between them and Melville Island. A northwest passage was discovered. All doubt as to the existence of a water communication between the two great oceans was removed, and it now only remained for Captain McClure and his men to perfect the work by traversing the few thousand miles of water between them and their homes. The explorers spent other two winters in the ice, but little progress was made towards the goal of their ambition. Scurvy broke out, provisions ran short, and at length McClure had reluctantly to abandon his ship. Help, however, was at hand. Just as the first detachment was about to leave the investigator, a stranger was seen approaching. When he came within speaking distance, he shouted, I am Lieutenant Pym of the Resolute, now lying off Melville Island. Deliverance had come at last, and the news spread through the ship like wildfire, infusing new life into frames almost worn out with privation and disease. Instead of a long and weary march over unknown regions, which would most likely terminate in death, the men knew that a journey of twelve days would take them on board the Resolute, where comfort awaited them. McClure writes, Despondency fled the ship, and Lieutenant Pym received a welcome, pure, hearty, and grateful, that he will assuredly remember and cherish to the end of his days. In April 1854, the explorers left the Resolute to travel over the ice to Beachy Island, where a ship was expected to be stationed. The journey was one of great hardship, for the cold was so intense that the men's stockings and moccasins were frozen so firmly together that they had to be cut off the feet, which were literally encased in ice. On reaching Beachy Island, a ship called the North Star was in waiting, and they were taken on board. The return journey was commenced about the middle of August. Sailing through Lancaster Sound, 
the North Star entered the Atlantic, and the Northwest Passage was accomplished. When the explorers reached England, after an absence of four years and ten months, they were received with every demonstration of joy. The sum of ten thousand pounds was granted by Parliament to the officers and men, in consideration of their having been the first to pass from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean by the Arctic Sea. McClure had been unable to find any traces of the missing expedition under Sir John Franklin, and the fate of the gallant explorer was still a mystery. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fate of Franklin As time passed on, and expedition after expedition returned without bringing any news of the Erebus and Terror, public anxiety increased but nothing further was heard of the missing explorers till 1854. Then some definite traces were found by Dr. Ray, who for several years had been engaged in the search by the Hudson Bay Company. While exploring the western shore of Boothia, he fell in with an Eskimo, to whom he put the usual question. Have you seen white men before? He said, no, but he had heard of a number having died far to the west. Noticing a gold cap band round the man's head, the doctor asked him where he had obtained it, and he said it had been got where the dead white men were. Ray bought the cap band, and told him that if he or his companions had any other things which had belonged to the white men, to bring them to Repulse Bay, where they would obtain good prices for them. Later in the year, a party of Eskimos arrived at Repulse Bay, and from them Ray obtained the information that, in the spring about four years before, Forty white men had been seen dragging a boat and sledges over the ice near King William Land. None of the party could speak the Eskimo language so well as to be understood, but, by signs, the natives were led to believe that their ships had been crushed by the ice. The bodies of thirty men had afterwards been found on the mainland, and five others on an island near it. Some had died in the tents, some had been buried, but many of them died as they fell, and were left behind, the survivors being too exhausted to attend to their burial. Ray also bought from the natives a number of articles which were known to have been in possession of the officers of the expedition, including some silver spoons and forks, an order of merit in the form of a star, and a small plate engraved, Sir John Franklin, C.B. The weight of such evidence was too great to be resisted, and the government awarded the discoverer and his men £10,000 for having been the first to bring any trustworthy news of the lost explorers. Still, however, nothing was known of the actual fate of the expedition, and Lady Franklin, the noble-hearted wife of the lost navigator, wrote an eloquent and pathetic appeal to the government, urging them to send out a final expedition to search for any possible survivor. She pleaded that the bones of the dead might be sought for and gathered together that their buried records be unearthed or recovered from the hands of the Eskimos, and, above all, that their last written words, so precious to their bereaved families and friends, be saved from destruction. This final and exhaustive search, 
she added, is all I seek in behalf of the first and only martyrs to Arctic discovery in modern times, and it is all I ever intend to ask. This request was, as it seems to us, heartlessly refused, on the plea that, as there was no prospect of saving life, the risk inseparable from such an enterprise would not be justified. But the noble and true woman, who had already fitted out three expeditions without success, resolved to employ what remained to her of her fortune in fitting out a final search expedition. Fortunately, the time had not come when Englishmen would stand idly by and allow a woman to undertake such an enterprise single-handed, and from many quarters came substantial offers of help. A steam yacht named the Fox was purchased and made ready without loss of time. Captain McClintock, who had seen much service in the Polar Sea, was chosen for the command. His instructions from Lady Franklin were contained in the following words. As to the objects of the expedition and their relative importance, I am sure you know that the rescue of any possible survivor of the Erebus and Terror would be to me, as it would to you, the noblest result of our efforts. On the 1st of July, 1857, the Fox set sail from Aberdeen with a crew of 25 men, 17 of whom had previously served in the Arctic search. The second officer in command was Lieutenant Hobson. At the end of the month, they arrived off the coast of Greenland, where they wintered. On the 17th of April, 1858, the ice broke up, and McClintock determined to try and push forward. Though the fox was in frequent danger of being crushed to pieces by huge masses of floating ice, she steamed bravely on, and entered Lancaster Sound. Sailing through Barrow Strait, McClintock steered in a southerly direction for twenty-five miles down Peel Strait, when he had to return on account of the ice. Several Eskimos were seen, but none of them had any knowledge of the missing ships or men of Franklin's expedition. The winter of 1858-59 was spent in Bellot Strait, which divides Boothia from North Somerset, and preparations were made for a series of sledge excursions in the spring. On the 17th of February, 1859, Captain McClintock started on a preliminary journey southward along the western shore of Boothia. Having arrived in the neighbourhood of the magnetic pole without finding any traces, the gallant captain began to fear that his journey would prove a failure. On looking behind them, however, the explorers were surprised to see four men following in their footsteps. McClintock and the interpreter at once advanced to meet them. During the conversation, he observed a naval button on one of their dresses, and on his asking where it had been obtained, the Eskimos replied that, it came from some white people who were starved upon an island where there are salmon, that is, an island in a river, and that the iron of which their knives were made came from the same place. McClintock hired the Eskimos, at the rate of a needle for each man, to build him a snow hut which they finished in an hour. Here the explorers took up their abode, and told the Eskimos that they wished to trade with them, and promised to buy everything which belonged to the starved white men, if they would come to the hut on the morrow. Next day, the population of the whole village arrived, amounting to forty-five souls, 
from aged people to infants in arms. McClintock purchased all the relics they produced, consisting of six silver spoons and forks, a silver medal, part of a gold chain, several buttons, and knives made of the iron and wood of the wreck, as well as bows and arrows constructed of materials obtained from the same source. None of the people had seen the whites alive. Only one man had seen their bones upon the island where they died. With high hopes, McClintock and his men reached the ship on the 14th of March, and immediately began to hasten the preparations for the departure of the sledge expeditions. This journey completed the discovery of the entire coastline of Arctic North America. On the 2nd of April, 1859, Captain McClintock and Lieutenant Hobson set out in search of the relics of the Franklin expedition. Each of the leaders had a sledge drawn by four men, besides a dog sledge and dog driver. No natives were seen till the 20th, when two Eskimo families were met with. From them, some important relics, and still more important information, were obtained. They learnt that two ships had been seen by the natives of King William Island. One of them had sunk in deep water, but the other was forced on shore by the ice. That must either be the Erebus or the Terror, was McClintock's inward observation, and he determined without loss of time to discover the position of the stranded ship. With this object in view, he dispatched Lieutenant Hobson to examine the west coast of the island, while he proceeded to explore the east coast. On the 7th of May, McClintock came across another Eskimo village. Here he purchased six pieces of silver plate, bearing the crests and initials of Franklin and several of his officers. The natives said that there was a wreck, distant five days' journey, but little of it now remained, as their countrymen had carried almost everything away. There had been many books, but all had been destroyed by the weather long since. An old woman and a boy who had last visited the wreck were brought before McClintock and closely questioned by the interpreter. She said, Many of the white men dropped by the way as they went to the great fish river. Some were buried, and some were not. Having obtained all the information which these people could give, the explorers set off without delay, and pushed on in the direction which, if their information was correct, would certainly yield the most splendid results. On the 25th of May, while walking on the shore, along which the survivors of the Franklin expedition must have marched, McClintock came upon a human skeleton partly exposed, with here and there a few fragments of clothing appearing above the snow. From the loose bow knot in which the neckerchief was tied, the captain concluded that the victim had been a steward or officer's servant. A clothes brush and a pocket book were found near at hand. The old woman's brief story, unsurpassed in graphic simplicity, was confirmed. They fell down and died as they walked along. Pressing on for twelve miles, McClintock came upon a small cairn, which the gallant Hobson, who had outmarched him, had built. It contained a note from the lieutenant, telling how he had reached this point six days before, without having seen anything of the wreck, but he had found a record for which, during the past ten years, thousands of miles of bleak coast had been explored, many hardships endured, and not a few valuable lives sacrificed. On an ordinary ship's paper, 
weather-stained, frayed with rust and ragged from damp and contact with the tin in which it was enclosed, the secret of the tragic fate of Franklin's expedition was revealed. 28th of May, 1847 Her Majesty's ships, Erebus and Terror, wintered in the ice in latitude 70 degrees 5 minutes north, longitude 98 degrees 23 minutes west. Having wintered in 1846-7 at Beachy Island in latitude 74 degrees 43 minutes 28 seconds north, longitude 91 degrees 39 minutes 15 seconds west, after having ascended Wellington Channel to latitude 77 degrees, and returned by the west side of Cornwallis Island. Sir John Franklin commanding the expedition. All well. Party consisting of two officers and six men left the ships on Monday the 24th of May, 1847. Graham Gore, Lieutenant. Charles F. DeVoe, mate. Round the margin of the paper were written the following notes. April the 25th, 1848. Her Majesty's ships, Terror and Erebus, were deserted on the 22nd of April, five leagues nor-nor-west of this, having been beset since the 12th of September, 1846. The officers and crews, consisting of 105 souls under the command of Captain F. R. M. Crozier, landed here in latitude 69 degrees 37 minutes 42 seconds north, longitude 98 degrees 41 minutes west. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June 1847 and the total loss by deaths in the expedition has been to this date nine officers and fifteen men. Signed, F. R. M. Crozier, Captain and Senior Officer. Signed, James Fitzjames, Captain, H. M. S. Erebus. And start tomorrow, the 26th, for Great Fish River. Resuming his journey, McClintock proceeded to the western extremity of the island, which he named Cape Crozier. Shortly after this, he found a large boat that had belonged to the Franklin expedition, and which contained two human skeletons and numerous other precious relics, including five watches, two guns, the fragment of a pair of worked slippers, and a few books, all of them scriptural or devotional works, except the Vicar of Wakefield. A small Bible contained numerous marginal notes, and whole passages underlined. Still following in the footsteps of Hobson, numerous other relics were found. The gallant lieutenant though so weak that he could barely drag his pain-racked and scurvy-stricken body along, worked almost night and day with an enthusiasm which no hardships could lessen. So thoroughly did he examine every spot that McClintock, coming over the same ground after him, could not discover any trace that had escaped him. Nothing, however, was seen of the wreck of which the Eskimos spoke, and the explorers concluded that the vessels had drifted south from the position in which they were abandoned, and that they were destroyed off the southwest coast of King William Island, having thus actually made the northwest passage, as a glance at the map will show. Both Franklin and McClure completed the Northwest Passage, but by different routes, the one to the south and the other to the north of Banksland. Franklin, however, made his passage two years before McClure. 
nothing now remained for the explorers but to make their way back to the ship which they reached on the nineteenth of june after an absence of seventy-eight days during which they had explored about five hundred miles of coast on the tenth of august the fox started on her homeward voyage and forty days later she reached the english channel when the men were paid off one of the first uses they made of their well-earned money was to present captain mcclintock with a gold chronometer as a mark of esteem and good will a statue of sir john franklin was erected in london as a national monument to the great explorer on the pedestal are the following words franklin to the great navigator and his brave companions who sacrificed their lives in completing the discovery of the northwest passage a d 1847 8 erected by the unanimous vote of parliament on beachy island where the three graves were found lady franklin caused to be erected a handsome monument bearing the inscription to the memory of franklin crozier fitz james and all their gallant brother officers and faithful companions who have suffered and perished in the cause of science and the service of their country this tablet is erected near the spot where they passed their first arctic winter and whence they issued forth to conquer difficulties or to die it commemorates the grief of their admiring countrymen and friends and the anguish subdued by faith of her who has lost in the heroic leader of the expedition the most devoted and affectionate of husbands and so he bringeth them unto the haven where they would be eighteen fifty five end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American Expeditions One of the best-known names in the history of Arctic exploration is that of Dr. Alicia Kent Kane. Though his expedition is usually considered as belonging to the Franklin search, it more properly comes under consideration in a chapter devoted to the part taken by our American kinsmen in endeavouring to open up a way to the North Pole, for it was conducted in a region in which there was no possibility of finding any traces of the great navigator and his companions. This is proved by the fact that the relics were found nearly a thousand miles to the south of where Kane was searching for them. On the 30th of May, 1853, the expedition sailed from New York in the Advance and reached Greenland on the 1st of July. After visiting several of the Danish settlements, Kane sailed northward and entered Smith Sound. He was the first man, either European or American, who had navigated the upper waters of this strait since its discovery by Baffin in 1616, and his experiences were not of a kind to tempt others to follow his route. Terrible storms were encountered, and several times the advance was with difficulty saved from being crushed to pieces by icebergs. Five times in three days the ship grounded, and on one of these occasions she heeled over so abruptly that the crew were thrown out of their berths. In one of the numerous inlets of Smith Sound, Kane took up his winter quarters, and in the ensuing spring, he sent out a number of sledge parties to explore to the northward. 
The sufferings of the men during these excursions were terrible in the extreme. Several died, while others suffered the amputation of parts of their feet for frostbite. The chief discovery of the expedition was made on the 4th of May, 1854. Seven days previously, Kane left the ship with a sledge party to explore the eastern shore of Smith Sound. After struggling on through snow up to their waists, which obliged them to unload the sledges and carry the cargo, they reached a most gigantic glacier, stretching along the coast in an unbroken line for 45 miles, and varying in height from 300 to 500 feet. This, the largest glacier known to exist, Kane named after Humboldt, the great scientist. Returning to the ship, Kane sent forward another party to explore the coast north of the Great Glacier. William Morton, the strongest man in the ship, was chosen to lead the enterprise. After passing the Humboldt Glacier, he pushed onward over a solid area choked with bergs and frozen fields. As he advanced, the ice became weaker and the dogs, seized with fear, refused to advance. At length, the firmer ice was reached, and shortly afterwards open water was seen two miles farther up the channel. In a perfect fever of excitement, he pushed on alone, and, climbing from rock to rock, he at length reached a point from which he gazed on the waters of an open polar sea. Morton named the point on which he stood Cape Constitution, and then made his way back to the ship. The advance had now spent two winters in the ice, and the state of affairs on board was appalling. Every man was stricken with scurvy, and the ship was little better than a floating hospital. Provisions were exhausted, and it seemed as if the region from which they had expected fame would at last be their grave. Cain, therefore, decided to abandon the ship and make for the nearest Greenland settlement. The retreat began, and for eighty-four days the miserable survivors dragged themselves along till they reached a Danish settlement on the west coast of Greenland. Here they found an American man-of-war, in which they returned to the States in safety. The next American expedition did not set out till 1860. In that year, Dr. Hayes sailed from Boston in the schooner United States, with a crew of 14 men, to continue the exploration of Smith Sound and prove the existence of an open polar sea. The explorers arrived safely at the entrance to the strait, but here their troubles begun. Storms came on, and all attempts to make the passage of the sound were in vain, and they were compelled at length to take shelter in a small bay, some distance to the southward of Kane's winter quarters in the advance. In this bay, which Hayes named Port Falk, they awaited the arrival of spring. On the 4th of April, 1861, Hayes set out on a sledge excursion to the north. After a journey of 46 days, he had the satisfaction of reaching a point farther north than that attained by Morton in the previous expedition. His farther progress was, however, stopped by extensive cracks in the ice. Wishing to find out what lay beyond, he climbed to the summit of a rugged cliff, about 800 feet high, and was rewarded for his toils by a sight which, to his mind, accomplished the object of the expedition. A broad crack, starting from the middle of the bay, stretched over the sea, and, uniting with other cracks as it meandered to the eastward, it expanded, 
as the delta of some mighty river discharging into the ocean, and, under a water sky which hung upon the northern and eastern horizon, it was lost in the open sea. All the evidences showed that I stood upon the shores of the polar basin, and that the broad ocean lay at my feet. The little margin of ice which lined the shore was being steadily worn away, and within a month the whole sea would be free from ice. Without a boat it was impossible to proceed farther, so Hayes, after planting a flag to mark the limit of his discovery, started on his return march and reached the ship on the 3rd of June. His journey had occupied two months, and during that time he had travelled 1,300 miles. The expedition was now at an end, and as soon as the ice broke up, all sail was set, and the United States arrived safely in Boston Harbour at the end of October. A third attempt was made to reach the North Pole in 1871 by Captain Charles Francis Hall, an American navigator. He set sail from New London on the 3rd of July in a small steamship named the Polaris. The progress made by the expedition was unusually rapid, and he reached Greenland about the middle of August. Sailing northward, he entered Smith Sound, which he navigated for a distance of 250 miles, passing through the open polar sea of Morton and Hayes, which turned out to be only an open reach of Smith Sound. He thus carried his ship nearer to the North Pole than any previous explorer. Farther progress was impeded by ice, but there were indications of water beyond, into which Hall was anxious to penetrate. Acting, however, on the advice of the sailing master, who seems to have been afraid of going too far, the captain decided to return, and seek a harbour for the winter. The Polaris was laid up in an inlet to which she gave her name. While preparations were being made for wintering, Captain Hall started northwards on a sledge journey. A few bays were discovered and named, and on the 24th of October he returned to the ship. Three hours afterwards he took suddenly ill, and in a fortnight he died. Three days later he was buried by lantern light, the coffin being hauled to the grave on a sledge, over which the American flag was spread. Four years after his death, the English explorers placed a brass tablet at the foot of his grave, bearing the following inscription. Sacred to the memory of Captain C. F. Hall of the United States ship Polaris, who sacrificed his life in the advancement of science on the 8th of November, 1871. This tablet has been erected by the British Polar Expedition of 1875, who, following in his footsteps, have profited by his experience. After the death of Hall, the command of the expedition fell on the sailing master, Captain Buddington. On the 12th of August, 1872, the homeward voyage was commenced. Shortly afterwards, the Polaris was caught in the ice and drifted out into Baffin Bay. During the night of the 15th of October, the ship was severely nipped. In a moment of panic, Captain Buddington shouted, "'Throw everything on the ice!' Immediately, the wildest confusion prevailed. Stores, provisions, bundles were seized and thrown overboard. One of the officers with a party of men went on to the floe and tried to put things in order, when suddenly the ship broke out and flew before the wind, leaving nineteen hands on the 
flow with the boats and provisions. The castaways drifted for a distance of sixteen hundred miles, suffering starvation and incredible hardships. At length, on the 29th of April, 1873, they were picked up by a sealing steamer and landed at St. John's, Newfoundland. Meanwhile, Captain Buddington and the men on board the Polaris had fared little better. Driven northward by the fury of the gale, the vessel had gone ashore on the east side of Smith Sound. From the 17th of October, 1872, till the 3rd of June, 1873, the survivors, numbering 14 men, lived on the beach. Then, having built two boats from the timbers of the wreck, they sailed south and were picked up by a Dundee whaler in Melville Bay. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Great Expedition of eighteen seventy five During the long period of twenty years, from the time that the investigator was abandoned in the ice, the British government appear to have considered Arctic discovery as a play that was hardly worth the somewhat expensive candles used in its illumination, and the honour of Great Britain as the first maritime power of the world was maintained in the Arctic seas wholly by private enterprise. The success of the American expeditions under Kane Hayes and Hall roused many of our most distinguished geographers and men of science to action, and early in 1874 they petitioned the government to send out an expedition of discovery to the Arctic regions to uphold the naval renown of England. It was not, however, till the 17th of November that Mr. Disraeli, the Prime Minister, announced that Her Majesty's Government had determined to lose no time in organising a suitable expedition to explore the region of the North Pole. Energetic steps were at once taken to hurry on the preparations. Two ships, named the Alert and the Discovery, were commissioned, and George S. Nares, the distinguished captain of the Challenger, was ordered home from Hong Kong to take the command. Sir Leopold McClintock superintended the fitting out of the vessels, and no labour or expense was spared that might ensure the success of the expedition. On the 25th of May, 1875, the Alert and the Discovery left Portsmouth Harbour, amid the hearty cheers of a vast crowd of spectators. Before starting, Captain Nares received a telegram from the Queen, saying, I earnestly wish you and your gallant companions every success, and I trust that you may safely accomplish the important duty you have so bravely undertaken. To this... Nares sent the following short and sailor-like reply. Her Majesty may depend on all doing their duty. A stormy passage across the Atlantic thoroughly tested the qualities of the ships, and it was not till the 6th of July that the coast of Greenland was reached. Here, Several days were spent in taking on board additional stores and coal. An interpreter, an Eskimo guide, and twenty-four dogs were also shipped. Starting again on the 22nd, both vessels proceeded in a northwesterly direction for Smith Sound, and seven days later, Nares cast anchor in Port Falk. Some time was now spent in examining the neighbouring country, 
and numerous articles which had belonged to Hall's ill-fated expedition were found. From an altitude of 700 feet, with the horizon distinctly visible, no ice was in sight, and there was every prospect of the expedition attaining a higher latitude without trouble. But within 24 hours after the ships had sailed, they were locked in by ice, 25 miles higher up the strait. This was another instance of the ever-changing nature of the Arctic regions, and caused Nares, in his narrative of the expedition, to draw attention to the deceptive impressions inexperienced people naturally receive when, from a lofty lookout, they observe a sea unbordered by ice. From our former position, the inexperienced observer would conclude that there was an open polar sea. From our present position, he would as certainly conclude that his farther progress was for ever stayed, and that the sooner he looked for winter quarters, the better. On the morning of the 4th of August, the ice eased off the land, and the voyage was resumed. Farther progress would have been impossible without the aid of steam, for the ice gathered round the ships in such thickness as to completely shut them up. In this dilemma, a novel expedient was resorted to. Of the two ships, the Discovery had the sharper bow, so she went first, and, charging the ice at the top of her speed, forced her way into the pack, burying her bows in it as far aft as the foremast. It speaks well for the strength of the vessel that, after several days of such work, she had sustained no serious damage. Lady Franklin Bay was reached on the 24th of August, and, finding there a suitable place for winter quarters, Nares decided to leave the Discovery and push northward with the alert. Taking Lieutenant Rawson and seven men of the Discovery with him, Captain Nares set sail. On reaching Robeson Channel, he was detained for some time by ice. Escaping by the power of steam, which enabled him to force his way through the pack, he sailed up the channel, and on the 1st of September, the first triumph of the expedition was achieved. At noon on that day, says Nares, having carried Her Majesty's ship into a higher latitude than ever before attained, the ensign was hoisted at the peak. The explorers had now arrived on the shore of the Arctic Ocean, but they found it exactly the opposite of an open polar sea, and on the 16th of September, the alert was effectually closed in for the winter. Everything was now made snug on board. The ship was housed over, and all the provisions and stores that were not likely to be harmed by the weather were placed on shore. The winter passed away so pleasantly that, not until the sun actually returned on the 1st of March, did we in any way realise the intense darkness we must have experienced for so long a period. During the early days of spring, a light sledge party set out, and, after a journey of sixty miles, reached Discovery Bay, the winter quarters of their consort, where they found all well. In April, the great sledge excursions were commenced. Seven sledges, with fifty-three officers and men, all in excellent health and spirits, set out from the alert. The northern expedition, under Captain A. H. Markham and Lieutenant Parr, equipped for an absence of seventy days, was to force its way northward over the ice. The western expedition, under Lieutenant Aldridge, 
was to explore the north shore of Grantland, and the Greenland expedition, under Lieutenants Beaumont and Rawson of the Discovery, was to explore the northern shores of Greenland. Each sledge carried extra tea in lieu of the midday allowance of spirits. Both officers and men were unanimous in favour of the change, and willingly put up with the misery of standing still in the cold during the long halt needed for the purpose of boiling the water, and all agreed that they worked better after the tea lunch. In May, scurvy broke out on the alert, but the symptoms were not so serious as to cause any alarm. It spread, however, with great rapidity, and in a few weeks twenty of the crew were under the doctor's care. A message from Captain Stevenson of the Discovery at this time stated that four of his men were also down with the disease. Considering the ample equipment and carefully prepared provisions with which the two ships were furnished, the outbreak was both inexplicable and unlooked for. The disease was not, however, confined to those left behind in the ships. On the 8th of June, Lieutenant Parr arrived with the news that nearly the whole of the crew belonging to the northern sledge party had been attacked with scurvy and were in need of immediate assistance. Markham had succeeded in bringing the invalids to a point thirty miles from the ship, but each day was adding to the number of the sick and making progress more difficult. He had therefore decided to halt and send Pa forward to bring relief. A rescue party was immediately dispatched under Lieutenant May, but before it arrived, one of the men died. Fresh food and medicines saved the lives of the remainder, and by easy stages they returned to the ship. Out of the thirty-seven men composing this expedition, the two officers alone escaped the disease. Markham's journey was productive of great results. It had been an incessant battle to overcome ever-recurring obstacles, each hard-won success stimulating them for the next struggle. Instead of advancing with a steady walk, more than half of each day was spent by the whole party facing the sledge and pulling it forward a few feet at a time. Under these circumstances, the distance attained, short as it may be considered by some, was truly marvellous. Though they had only reached a point about eighty miles from the ship, the total distance travelled was 276 miles on the outward and 245 miles on the homeward journey. Markham and his brave companions had carried the Union Jack within 400 miles of the North Pole, and they would have attained a still higher latitude had not the condition of the men made an immediate return imperative. Fears for the condition of the Western explorers now caused Nares to send out a sledge party under Lieutenant May, with the necessary remedies should they be found suffering from scurvy. On the 19th of June, he met them near the spot to which Markham had returned without assistance. Scurvy had been at work among this party also, and there was only one man, besides Lieutenant Aldridge, who was not completely prostrated. Relief had come just in the nick of time, for they would not have been able to travel another day. Many of the poor fellows were so weakened by their sufferings that they burst into tears on the arrival of help. Under the influence of the medicines and generous diet which May had brought with him, the scurvy-stricken men gradually recovered and reached the ship after an absence of eighty-two days. 
Lieutenant Aldridge had explored 230 miles of coast, the greater part of which had never before been visited. No land or appearance of land was seen at any time to the northward or westward, from which circumstance Nares concluded that no land could possibly exist within an attainable distance from the coast. The Greenland expedition had fared no better than the other two. Shortly after they had started, one of the men developed symptoms of scurvy, and had to be taken back by Lieutenant Rawson. Beaumont continued his journey, and succeeded in reaching latitude 82 degrees 18 minutes north, and discovering what seemed to be an island, but most probably a continuation of the Greenland coast. Scurvy was by this time rampant among the men, and the lieutenant had no alternative but to turn back. Gallantly the little party struggled on, sometimes making no more than a mile a day. Beaumont now began to fear that he would not be able to reach the ship without terrible loss, for it was evident that many of the men were on the point of death. Fortunately, just when affairs had reached a crisis, Lieutenant Rawson came up, bringing with him one of the doctors of the expedition. Lime juice and a plentiful supply of fresh meat soon restored the invalids to their usual health, and they were able to make their way to the ship. Only two men lost their lives, and it was entirely due to the timely arrival of Lieutenant Rawson that more fatalities did not occur. It now became necessary for Nares to decide his future course of action whether he should remain another winter in his present quarters, or return to England. He made up his mind to the latter alternative, for the following reasons. He says, On considering the result of the spring sledging operations, I concluded that, owing to the absence of land trending to the northward, and the polar pack not being navigable, no ship could be carried north on either side of Smith Sound beyond the position we had already attained, and also that from any attainable position in Smith Sound it was impossible to advance nearer the pole by sledges. Accordingly, on the 31st of July, the Alert sailed out of her winter quarters and steered for Discovery Bay. A month later, the two vessels in company steamed down the strait, and on the 10th of September reached open water. On their arrival in England, the explorers were received with great enthusiasm, and the results of the expedition caused general satisfaction. Captain Nares had carried the alert to a higher latitude than had ever before been reached in ships. He had discovered that the Polar Sea was a sea of ancient ice, and not, as had been said, an open sea. His sledges had reached a point nearer the pole than had ever before been attained, and he had conducted the whole expedition in a manner which showed that the heroic spirit that had won for Britain all the great prizes of Arctic discovery in the past still remained unimpaired. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Voyage of the Jeannette. George W. DeLong of the United States Navy, after some experience in the Arctic regions, expressed a strong desire to solve the problem which had baffled so many. 
He therefore made a request to Mr. James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald to fit out an expedition to the North Pole. Mr. Bennett at once fell in with the proposal, and eager inquiries were made for a vessel suitable for the purpose. Great difficulty was experienced, as the owners of good sealers or whalers were not willing to sell their vessels at any price. At length, the Pandora, the property of Sir Alan Young, and used by him as a pleasure yacht in the Arctic regions, was secured, and its name changed to the Jeannette. Writing to Mr. Bennett, De Long said, there are three ways for us to send the expedition, Smith Sound, Bering Strait, and east coast of Greenland. Of the three, I am in favour of Bering Strait. In this letter, the explorer gave an estimate of the expense of a three years cruise, and asked for sealskin clothing, a number of dogs, and a quantity of coal, to be provided at Alaska, and to be picked up on the route. In the meantime, Bennett had consulted Dr. Peterman, the German geographer, who had been studying the North Pole problem for thirty years. He declared that the Pole could never be reached by Smith Sound or Baffin Bay, and that it was only through pride that the English held to this route. Peterman agreed with Bennett that the pole could only be reached by a dash, and should be done in one summer. He even professed himself willing to try the experiment for a three-months cruise. Wintering in the Arctic regions was, in his opinion, a decided mistake. It is only fair to say that Bennett did not quite agree with the doctor in the possibility of visiting the Pole in a three-months trip. The Jeannette was thoroughly refitted at Southampton, and from thence proceeded to San Francisco. Here numerous alterations were made, until at length De Long expressed himself perfectly satisfied, declaring that the vessel's outfit was simply perfect for ice navigation, astronomical work, magnetic work, gravity experiments, or collections of natural history. He says, We have a good crew, good food, and a good ship and I think we have the right kind of stuff to dare all that man can do. The founder of the expedition was not able to witness the departure of the Jeannette when she set out on her voyage. He, however, sent a telegram to the captain, expressing confidence in his energy and pluck, and an assurance that if the vessel was ice-bound, he should spare neither money nor influence to send assistance. He also wished the men to be informed that if they lost their lives in the undertaking, their widows would be under his protection. In July 1879, the Jeannette left San Francisco, accompanied by the schooner Fanny, carrying an extra supply of coals and provisions. Reaching St. Michael's about the middle of August, De Long found the fur clothing and the dogs and sleds waiting his arrival. Here he took on board the cargo and provisions which had been brought by the schooner, also two natives, to act as interpreter and dog driver. Having passed through Bering Strait, the vessel made for Herald Island, and drifted into an ice floe, to which it was anchored. For fear of being closed in, the ship was kept turning round in circles during the night. But little progress was made, for the ice was between twelve and fifteen feet in thickness. Wherever a crack or a narrow opening showed itself, the vessel was judiciously rammed, and then, by backing and ramming, forced her way slowly through. 
On the 6th of September, the ship was unable to proceed any farther, and preparations were made to reach Harold Island by means of a sledge. This was successfully accomplished, but the island was reported to be of no use as a station for winter quarters. A few days afterwards, two large bears were caught in traps, and both of them were killed. When weighed, they were found to be 400 and 600 pounds, respectively. The vessel continued to drift in the ice flow for several days, and during this time, two walruses, each more than 1,000 pounds in weight, were shot. This was a valuable addition to the dog's food. Though fast in the ice, their position gave the captain considerable cause for anxiety. The trembling and creaking of the ship, and the grinding and crushing of the masses of ice, were an evidence of the tremendous pressure which was being exerted. De Long describes the view of the ice flow as magnificent, though awful, and their position like that of living over a powder mill waiting for an explosion. This experience of wintering in the pack was by no means agreeable, though the monotony which is inseparable from an Arctic winter was relieved by numerous hunting expeditions in which bears and other animals were killed, and afforded a supply of fresh meat. On some days, neither the men nor the dogs dared to venture on the ice, which was very treacherous and unsafe. They therefore suffered very much from want of exercise. Near the end of November, the Jeannette had a severe nip, the pressure became so great that the deck seemed ready to burst open. If she had not been very strong, there can be little doubt that she would have been cut in two. De Long says that November was a month of gales, ice pressures and discomforts, mental and physical. He hoped that December would drift them quietly and peaceably nearer the pole. Christmas Day, 1879, was the dreariest the captain had ever spent in his life. Yet up to this time, the expedition had met with no serious mishap. It had, however, been very unfortunate and the ice had closed round the vessel at an unusually early date, thus preventing them from making any progress. It was not until the officers and crew sat down to a grand banquet, prepared to celebrate the occasion, that they were for a time lifted out of their surroundings and able to forget the depressing influences which now seemed to be always present. Nothing further of any importance occurred till the 19th of January, 1880, when a most alarming discovery was made. The ship was leaking. An examination showed that two streams of water, an inch in diameter, were making their way into the fore part of the vessel. The pumps were at once manned, and, with a view to finding out the extent of the damage, a number of men were sent to remove the ice round the bows. But after they had dug away some of the pieces, the ice formed again so quickly that the attempt had to be given up. No sign of injury could be seen outside and a careful scrutiny inside showed nothing but the flowing of the water. De Long could therefore do nothing but keep the steam pump at work till an opportunity occurred of examining the vessel more thoroughly. Fortunately, the general health of the explorers suffered in no way from their long confinement, and with the return of spring, Preparations were made to resume the voyage as soon as the ice broke up. In this, however, 
they were doomed to disappointment, and it was not until the 1st of September, 1880, that the Jeannette was again on an even keel. This was but the beginning of fresh troubles. The leak, which had stopped on the 3rd of July, after months of hard pumping, again broke out as mysteriously as before, and the pumps were once more brought into use. The explorers had now spent a year in the ice, and they were only 150 miles to the northward and westward of where they entered it. The ice was again closing rapidly round them, and, heart-sick with disappointment and delay, they prepared for the second winter in the pack. "'We cannot,' says De Long in his journal, "'prevent any disaster that may befall us, and we have made all possible provision for its coming. Human strength is of no avail, and human wisdom of no value.' In our position we have done all that man can do, and we must leave the rest with God. The records of these long, dreary months are as uninteresting to read as they must have been tedious to endure. Eating, sleeping, and taking observations, with an oft-recurring bear hunt, followed each other with monotonous regularity. The conditions of the surroundings remained unchanged, and the prospects of deliverance from their icy prison came to be regarded by the explorers as more and more remote. During sixteen months they had drifted in the ice pack a distance of 1,300 miles, far enough, if in a straight line, to reach the pole and beyond it but they were actually only 220 miles from where they had been beset, and for a year they had pumped a leaking ship. It speaks volumes for the stout-hearted spirit of the men that they did not give way to despair and become victims to disease and the rigours of the climate. On the 16th of May, 1881, land was seen in the distance. It proved to be a small island, and was named after the Jeannette. A few days later, another island was seen, which the explorers named Henrietta Island. This was the first land their eyes had rested on since leaving Harold Island. The ship was now drifting in the pack rapidly northward, and as she advanced, the condition of the surroundings became daily more threatening. The cracking and grinding of the ice had become a familiar sound to the explorers by this time, so they usually paid little attention to these disturbances. On the 12th of June, however, considerable alarm was felt, owing to the Jeannette being caught between two immense masses of ice. To provide against any emergency that might arise, some of the boats were lowered and hauled to a safe distance. Orders were also given to convey the sleds and a quantity of provisions to the same spot. The pressure continued with tremendous force, and it soon became evident that the Jeannette was doomed. The deck began to give way, and the starboard side seemed to be on the point of being crushed inwards. Clothing, bedding, books and papers were now removed without delay, and in a short time the ship began to fill. At four o'clock on the morning of the 13th, she went down in 77 degrees, 14 minutes, 57 seconds, north latitude, and 154 degrees, 58 minutes, 45 seconds, east longitude. That night, the explorers camped on the ice, and early next morning began their preparations for a march to the southward. Several days were spent at this work, 
and on the 18th the party, consisting of eight officers and 25 men, started over the ice, hoping to reach the New Siberian Islands, and from thence to make their way to the coast of Siberia. They had with them three boats mounted on runners, and two sledges, carrying a supply of provisions for sixty days. The march over the frozen ocean was a terrible undertaking. During the next three months, the men had to struggle with almost insurmountable obstacles. Compelled to drag their heavy boats and loads of provisions over broken and shifting fields of ice, and at times ferrying them over water spaces, their progress was necessarily slow, amounting on one occasion to no more than half a mile in six hours. On the 11th of July, after 23 days of toil and anxiety, Bennett Island was discovered. Here they landed, and spent eight days in making the necessary repairs to the boats. Just as they were about to set out again, a westerly gale, accompanied by fog, sleet and snow, compelled them to delay their departure till the 16th of August. A further delay of ten days was afterwards forced upon the party by the condition of the ice, which rendered progress impossible. A few days later, open water was reached, and they launched their boats with the feeling that their sufferings were nearly at an end. On the 12th of September, the three boats were separated during a gale off the Siberian coast, and about 90 miles northeast of the delta of the River Lena. One of them was never heard of again. De Long's boat, with a crew of 13 men, succeeded in reaching land, but they had to abandon their boat, about two miles from the beach, and wade ashore through the ice and mud, carrying the remainder of the provisions on their backs. They landed, frostbitten and exhausted, and began a painful journey in search of some inhabited village. Manfully they struggled on, though each day the number of their party was reduced by death. At length, in despair, the captain sent two sailors forward to try and bring relief. These men were eventually found and rescued by some natives, who treated them with the greatest kindness. After their departure, De Long and the few survivors with him were reduced to terrible straits, and, after eating their remaining dog, they perished from hunger and cold about the end of October. Meanwhile, the second boat, with eleven of a crew under Chief Engineer Melville, had succeeded in reaching an inhabited village where the famished and frostbitten men were kindly received and supplied with food. Some time after his arrival in the village, Melville met the two seamen whom De Long had sent forward, and he at once started to try and rescue his missing commander. In this he was unsuccessful, and, after nearly losing his own life from cold and hunger, he was obliged to give up the search. In the following spring, he again set out, and on the 23rd of March discovered the bodies of De Long and his ill-fated companions, almost covered with the snow, together with the records of the expedition. On a rising ground some distance from the river, Melville buried the bodies and set up a wooden cross to mark the spot. On his return journey, he met some of the members of a relief expedition which had been sent out in June 1881 by the United States government to search for the Jeannette. Their vessel had been burned while in winter quarters, and they, 
unwilling to give up the search, had travelled across Siberia. Having now ascertained the fate of De Long, they returned home. Previous to this, the steamer Alliance, sent out in the spring of 1881 at the request of Mr. Bennett, had failed to find any traces of the lost explorers, though she sailed as far north as the 82nd parallel. So ended the Jeannette expedition. Though the lofty aims of its projectors were not realised, it was not through any fault of the officers and men. The record of the hardships they endured, and the difficulties they overcame, is one of the grandest stories of Arctic heroism. Sacrifice is nobler than ease. Unselfish life is consummated in lonely death, and the world is richer by this gift of suffering. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Farthest North The most famous enterprise of more modern times is that known as the Lady Franklin Bay Expedition, which sailed from America in 1881 in command of Lieutenant Greeley. The object of this expedition was to reach Discovery Bay, and there erect a dwelling from which exploring parties could be sent out and observations made of the phenomena of the Arctic regions. The explorers, twenty-five in number, embarked on board the Proteus, and, after a short and prosperous voyage, they reached their destination on Smith Sound. Without delay, a small wooden house was erected, to which they gave the name of Fort Conger, and then, on the 26th of August, the Proteus sailed south on her homeward voyage, intending to return in the following year, with a fresh supply of provisions and other necessaries. After the departure of the ship, Greeley and his companions busied themselves in putting their house in order, in anticipation of their first Arctic winter. Never before had men in such a position a greater number of home comforts at their command. They were housed in a well-built wooden dwelling, with a plentiful supply of provisions, and they had a library containing, besides reference books and works on Arctic exploration, about a thousand novels and magazines. A school was held three times a week, and for a short period a newspaper was conducted. Lectures and impromptu concerts were also given. Christmas Day was celebrated with due ceremony, and the rooms were tastefully decorated, and, for the first time under such circumstances, each man received a Christmas present, which had been sent by kind and thoughtful friends. With the return of spring, several sledge parties were organised. The equipment for each sledge consisted of an army tent, with sleeping bags of well-tanned buffalo hide, capable of holding two men. Dr. Pavey, the medical officer of the expedition, explored the coast some distance to the north of Cape Joseph Henry. Lieutenant Greeley led a party into the interior of Grinnell Land, and Lieutenant Lockwood was entrusted with the exploration of the North Greenland coast. The journey performed by this last-mentioned officer was the crowning feat of the expedition, and ranks as the greatest in Arctic history. The party set out on the 3rd of April, 1882, with an advanced sledge hauled by dogs and driven by an Eskimo, 
and four supporting sledges drawn by members of the expedition early in the journey the intense cold began to tell on the men their sleeping bags were like iron and sleep was out of the question our teeth were clattering and clashing together in a most dangerous manner one of the men had his toes frozen in his sleeping bag and the cook had his fingers frozen while preparing breakfast storms came on and made it impossible for the men to cook their meals and on one occasion they spent forty-five hours in the sleeping bags suffering discomforts that words would fail to describe and which can only be understood by those who have had a similar experience another violent gale was encountered a few days after this while at work the men were frequently blown over and one gust of wind lifted the dog sledge with its weight of two hundred pounds bodily from the ground the tents were repeatedly blown down and travelling gear scattered and the sleeping bags were so badly frozen that the strength of four men was required to open them the journal of this excursion is a long record of storms and violent gales varied by an occasional breakdown of one or other of the sledges well might one of the explorers remark we imagine that no other party in the arctic regions has ever passed through discomforts similar to those experienced by us on the twenty eighth of april lockwood decided to send back the supporting party and advance with the dog sledge and two men on the following day he set out accompanied by sergeant brainard and an eskimo dog driver fourteen or fifteen hours of constant work brought them in twenty-five marches to lockwood island here the lieutenant took an observation and found his position to be in eighty-three degrees twenty-three point eight minutes north of this event brainard writes we had now reached a higher latitude than ever before attained by mortal man and on a land farther north than was supposed by many to exist we unfurled the glorious stars and stripes to the exhilarating northern breeze with an exultation impossible to describe the honours of the farthest north which had been held by england for three centuries were thus won for america by lieutenant lockwood and his trusty companion brainard provisions were now running short so after spending two days on the island for rest and observation they set out on the return journey which was safely accomplished on the first of june after an absence of sixty days the second winter spent at ford conger did not pass as pleasantly as the first the steamer which was expected with fresh stores did not arrive and the men had consequently to be put on short allowance fortunately their health and spirits continued excellent and they looked hopefully forward to the arrival of the relieving vessel in the spring but these hopes were doomed to disappointment the summer came but the steamer did not arrive and greeley had therefore no alternative but to order the retreat to the south a small steam launch named the lady greeley and three boats were their only means of escape on the ninth of august eighteen eighty three greeley and his companions set out on their hazardous voyage to the south and as they hoped to safety the launch led the way with the boats in tow to provide against serious loss arising from an accident to any of the boats the records provisions 
coal and other supplies were divided among the party as equally as possible heavy fogs were encountered and the launch had to be slowed down to half speed for the presence of large masses of ice made rapid steaming extremely dangerous on the thirteenth the voyagers came to an enormous floeberg about sixty feet high which effectively stopped their farther progress there was nothing to be done but wait till the mass was broken up or removed next morning however they found that a passage had been opened for them in a most unexpected manner during the night the floe had split in two and divided leaving an opening just wide enough to admit the lady greeley and her attendant boats the narrow cleft presented to our view afforded perhaps the most wonderful passage ever traversed by any voyagers scarcely a dozen feet wide it was over a hundred yards long and its perpendicular walls of opaque ice reached fully fifty feet skyward above our passing boats i recall no other mass which has so impressed me with the grandeur and scope of nature's forces and works the sufferings of the party from cold were intense and the cramped positions which they had to occupy in the boats chilled them to the very marrow strong northeasterly gales drove the boats against the shore ice and it was with the most utmost difficulty that they were saved from being crushed to pieces the launch had eventually to be abandoned and for thirty days they lived on a moving floe which might at any moment have broken up and proved their destruction at length after toiling over a distance of nearly four hundred miles the weary and worn-out little band reached cape sabine in october fortunately without loss of life little did they think that nearly two months before their arrival the relief ship had gone down near that very spot their troubles now began in real earnest through the mismanagement and consequent failure of an expedition sent to their assistance they were doomed to spend the winter on this inhospitable shore an entry in lieutenant lockwood's diary at this time gives us the keynote of their position our tea is extremely weak this is a miserable existence only preferable to death get little sleep day or night on account of hard sleeping bag and cold the stock of provisions was gradually sinking a few foxes and some game which were shot from time to time warded off absolute starvation but many deaths occurred and the summer of eighteen eighty four found their numbers reduced to fourteen among the early victims was lieutenant lockwood no pen says greeley could ever convey to the world an adequate idea of the abject misery and extreme wretchedness to which we were reduced insufficiently clothed for months without drinking water destitute of warmth our sleeping bags frozen to the ground our walls roof and floor covered with frost and ice subsisting on one-fifth of an arctic ration almost without clothing heat or food yet we were never without courage faith and hope sealskin gloves pieces of leather and the oil tan skin from one of the sleeping bags formed the staple portion of their diet during the last dreadful months of eighteen eighty four at last on the morning of the twenty third of june relief came captain scotchley 
of the Thetis, who had been sent out by the American government to search for the lost explorers, had succeeded in penetrating the icy barrier and reaching the survivors when they were just at the last gasp. Greeley was found lying under the folds of the tent, so exhausted that he could hardly speak. Months of constant anxiety had reduced the once strong man to the utter helplessness of a child. Some of his comrades were even in a worse plight. Two lay on the ground with hands and feet frozen off, and another was dying. Out of the twenty-five men, who, three years before, had left their native country in the pride of strength and manhood, only five returned. The remainder had found rude graves in the regions which they had given their lives to open up, and their names were added to the glorious roll of those who search the storm-surrounded pole. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Still farther north. Dr. Fridtjof Nansen, the famous Norwegian explorer, is the hero of what is perhaps the crowning feat of Arctic exploration. He believed there was a current which flowed from the coast of Siberia towards Greenland, across the polar basin, and that a ship could be carried thither by this current if it were once safely embedded in the moving ice and allowed to drift. He therefore had a small wooden ship built, pointed at both ends, and with the hull shaped like a shallow, wide U, so that all ice which came in contact with it would be forced under the vessel, thus preventing nipping, and as the bottom was practically flat, she would be able to rest on the ice without toppling over like a vessel of ordinary build. On the 26th of October, 1892, the Fram, meaning onward, as Nansen called his polar ship, was launched at Christiania. It was rigged as a three-mastered schooner and fitted with a steam engine. Several months were spent in final preparations, and then, early in the morning of the 21st of June, 1893, Nansen sailed from Vardo with a crew of twelve picked men. The ship was equipped for an absence of five years. Proceeding eastward along the northern coasts of Europe and Asia, the Fram entered the ice off the mouth of the River Lena on the 22nd of September, and was soon afterwards fast in the pack. Arctic authorities in England and America regarded Nansen's project with but little favour. It was spoken of in some quarters as unwise, impracticable, and little short of suicidal. But even the most adverse critic could not but be impressed with the explorer's enthusiasm and his sublime faith in his theory. His undoubted qualifications as an Arctic traveller made it just possible that he might get through though nearly everyone was doubtful of his success. One of the last messages which Nansen sent to Europe shows the spirit in which he approached his great undertaking. He says, There will probably be a long period elapse before we are drifted across the unknown polar region and into open water again, or to some coast from which we can return home. In this time there will be nothing heard of us, but, when years have passed, I hope that you will some day get the news that we are all safely returned, and that the knowledge of man has advanced another step 
northward. These are the words of a brave and resolute man, marred neither by gloomy forebodings, nor boastful utterances, but illumined by a spirit of quiet confidence and hope. But to return to the Fram. So far Nansen's theory was right. Day after day she drifted northward in the ice, just as he had expected. During the autumn and winter the cold was very intense, and so keen was the frost that for weeks at a time the mercury in the thermometers was frozen. The health of all on board was excellent, and the time passed pleasantly. The sailors had plenty of amusement, the only disagreeable thing being the crashing and creaking as the ice closed round the ship. This, says Nansen, disturbed the men at their games now and again, but ordinarily they were too much given up to their play to let any Arctic influence trouble them much. Better men for such an expedition it would be difficult to find. Winter passed away, and the brief Arctic summer found the explorers in 81 degrees 52 minutes north latitude. After this, the current carried them southward for a time, but at the end of 1894 they had penetrated to 83 degrees 24 minutes, the most northerly point reached up to this time. Early in the following January, the ice-resisting qualities of the Fram were put severely to the test. She was frozen up in ice thirty feet thick, piled up on the port side in great masses, which towered over the bulwarks and threatened to bury, if not to crush her. In eager haste, boats, sledges, provisions, and other necessaries were placed on the ice, and every man stood ready to abandon the ship and continue their journey living on the flow. But when the pressure was at its highest, the Fram was forced gently upwards into safety without a single plank being damaged. Well might Nansen write, After this experience, I consider the Fram as good as impregnable. North and northwestward the explorers drifted rapidly. On the 3rd of March, 1895, the ship was in latitude 84 degrees 4 minutes north. At this point, Nansen decided to explore the sea to the north of the route, and when he made his intention known, Lieutenant Johansen volunteered to accompany him. A few days later, the two daring adventurers set out, leaving the Fram to continue the drift in charge of Otto Sverdrup, Nansen's well-tried comrade, in his journey across Greenland. They took with them twenty-eight dogs, three sledges, and two canoes, and carried a supply of provisions for a hundred days. Their purpose was to reach the highest possible latitude, and then return by Franz Josef Land to Spitsbergen, where they hoped to find a ship to take them home. At first they made rapid progress, but then the path became more uneven, and they had to cut their way over piled-up masses of ice. Still they pressed resolutely forward. It was a terrible journey. To save weight, they had left their furs behind them, and they suffered considerably. The difficulties of the road increased. Often the dogs were unable to proceed, and their drivers, with straining muscles, helped to drag the heavily laden sledges over the hummocks. Panting, yet stiff with cold, they would rest for a few moments at midday and eat a dinner of chocolate, then on again till night. Thus they went on day after day for six weeks, 
fighting their way to the pole, over ice and snow, swept by the fierce biting northern blast. With half-frozen fingers they made the necessary observations, and Nansen took photographs and even sketched. Often at the end of a day's march, they found that they had unconsciously drifted back twice as far as they thought they had travelled, but they pressed onward with a courage that death alone could kill. On the 7th of April, when they were at 86 degrees 14 minutes north latitude, they were forced to turn back. On the horizon, the ice lay everywhere piled up, like frozen breakers. The pole was beyond their reach, but they had won the farthest north, and something more. During the long period of 280 years previous to 1893, the combined efforts of all the Arctic expeditions succeeded only in travelling a 150 miles nearer the pole. Nansen, in three years, penetrated 200 miles beyond the farthest point then reached, covering the last 150 miles in a space of six weeks. We cannot dwell on the hardships of the return journey. The short summer was drawing to a close, and many miles had to be traversed before land could be reached. There was no time to lose. As they proceeded southward, the ice was much broken, and dogs and sledges sunk deep in the half-melted snow. The travellers were almost worn out, but they kept on with unceasing and strenuous efforts. No land was in sight, food was becoming scarce, and winter was drawing nigh. To add to the difficulties of their position, their watches stopped, and their map was unreliable, so that they had little knowledge of their whereabouts. At length, three islands were discovered, to which Nansen gave the name of Wittenland. The explorers proceeded in open water alongside the islands, and in a few days came upon a great stretch of land. Here they decided to spend the winter, as it was now too late to attempt the long journey to Spitsbergen. A hut was quickly constructed, of stones, earth, and moss, and covered with walrus skins. In this dreary solitude they passed the winter, six months of night, living on blubber and bear's flesh. How different would their lot have been, had they known that within a few miles was encamped a party of English explorers, belonging to the Jackson Harmsworth expedition. When we think of the hardships Nansen and his companion had already endured, their lack of proper food, and all the attendant circumstances, we are surprised to read that their health was excellent, and they were in good spirits. Christmas Day was perhaps the most melancholy, as they thought of what their loved ones were doing in the dear homeland far across the sea. At last spring came, with welcome sunshine, and the travellers made ready to start for Spitsbergen. On the 19th of May, 1896, they set out, but shortly afterwards severe storms came on, which delayed their farther progress till the 3rd of June. One morning, while Nansen, whose turn it was to act as cook, was preparing breakfast, he was startled by the barking of dogs. He at once awoke his companion, and they agreed there must be people near. Breakfast was quickly dispatched, and then Nansen set out in the direction from which the sounds proceeded, while Johansen remained by the tent. It was the 17th of June, and the members of the Jackson-Harmsworth expedition had just finished dinner, 
when one of their number saw the figure of a man on the horizon. Jackson at once set off to meet the stranger. After about an hour's walk, they came up to one another, and the Englishman was astonished to see that the stranger was as black as a stoker. His clothes were covered with grease. It was evident he had been in very rough circumstances for some time. As Jackson looked, he thought he recognised in the grimy figure before him his friend, Dr. Nansen. So he asked, "'Aren't you Nansen?' "'Yes, I'm Nansen.' "'By Jove!' exclaimed Jackson. "'I'm awfully glad to see you.' The two men shook hands heartily, and question and answer followed in quick succession. "'After some more talk, we again shook hands,' says Jackson." and I told him how immensely pleased I was to be the first person to congratulate him on his magnificent success. Three hearty cheers welcomed the gallant doctor to Elmwood, the English headquarters, and a party at once set out to bring in Johansson. They remained for six weeks at Elmwood, and then returned to Vardo in Jackson's ship, the Windward. Their sufferings and dangers were at an end. Shortly afterwards, the Fram arrived safely in port. On meeting with his men, Nansen was deeply moved, and embraced them one after the other as they came to congratulate him on his extraordinary journey, which, to quote Jackson's opinion, is absolutely unequalled for daring in the annals of discovery, either in Arctic or other regions. End of chapter 15 End of Stories of North Pole Adventure by Frank Mundell